one click. I did it. That's that's good luck. That means that we will successfully talk about pens and we won't deviate our topics. It will be well. Then it's not a pen cast. So we're not deviating. I know that's true. It, it won't be extemporaneous <laughs> nor superfluous. Oh, we're gonna be superfluous. All right. Heck yeah, man. Super fluous. Super fluous. Can you be just regular fluous? Ooh, good question. Kind of like, can you be couth? Can you be whelmed? Mm, exactly. You can be underwhelmed and overwhelmed. Stitious. Just a little stitious. Just a little stitious. Nice little office quote there. Yep. Let me try to stick it up here. I don't want to be. I don't want to be chapped on the. Uh, I had a pen cast. I, I was very smart, and I brought chapstick with me to the pen show in the in the old fanny pack and mm-hmm. used it mm-hmm. frequently. Was you got glad to. for it. Flapping yeah. your jaws all day. It's like well, also the air, the air, the airplane's so dry. Yeah, yeah, it is. It always messes me up, and I never have it. And I had it this time, and at this point, I feel like uh, I can take on the world because I did mm-hmm. that. Nothing can stop me now, except maybe Having a, a very time. large hyena. Are there large hyenas? They're pretty small. Well, I can take out a normal size hyena. That's why well, I guess I'm def- there's large ones if there's normal size yeah, ones. Yeah, that's why I'm differentiating, man. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. All right, you ready? Uh, is this 103? It is 103. It's 103. 103. I have no sense of time. Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, tell the. With tell, your permi- do I have your permission? Yeah, tell everybody that. Let, let them know. Let them know where they're at. All right, all right. What to expect. All right, we're going to go. We're going to go in color now. Here we go. Okay. <gasps> Welcome, everybody, to episode number 103 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about our favorite pens of each nib size, which is really tough. Like, literal favorite nib of pen up per size. The question looked like it was easier. Yeah, than Drew it was. dropped this in there and I was like, yeah. Dad it, Drew, this is a hard one. Yeah, sorry. So I we'll, we'll stumble that. through that one. Um, we're gonna talk about what's the culprit of nib creep. Is it the nib, the feed, or the ink? Uh, what to look for if you want to work for a company with a healthy culture, because we got somebody that likes our culture, and asked me. Uh, what limits that we would set on our own pen collecting if money was no object? It's a good question. You'll have more limits than I will, I think. I had nothing Not but limits it. in my life. <laughs> uh, we also have Drew recapping his experience at the San Francisco Pen Show that he just went to. And we have an interview with Mark Dwight of Rickshaw Bagworks, also known as Mr. Shaw. Mr. Mr. Rick, Rick Shaw himself. Shaw. Yes. He told me at the show this past weekend he was going to get a shirt that said something like that. <laughs> He's just going to embrace it. Hi, my name is Rick. Something know. like that. Yeah, yeah. That's Mr. Good. Shaw. That's yeah. good. He leans into it. He's a good guy. All right. Well, we'll start off this episode with some feedback. Brian, you must forgive the formatting here. I did this. Yeah, it's like huge. It's taking up all the space. I did this part on my phone when I was at home this morning. (laughs) Okay. So I screenshot it instead of copy and paste. So shrink this down a little bit. I know. I'm sorry. It's like burning my eyes. (laughs) All right. Uh, Something Stonewolf uh, says... Really love listening to the two of you while I work. I'm a hand bookbinder and have kept a journal for over 30 years, ever since my first fountain pen discovery. Nice. Question to you both. What do you write with all those pens of yours? Mm. Um, put simply, everything. Because when I reach for a writing utensil, I don't reach for anything but a fountain pen. So whether I want to take notes, whether I'm just you know doodling, whether I'm sitting down and actually expressing thoughts from time to time. I don't have a set time during my day where I just say, okay, time to write. I just, mm-hmm. whenever I need to write, I write with a fountain pen. So it literally is everything. Same. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's the short answer. Nothing super profound there. Just mm-hmm. when writing, yeah, it is a fountain pen. Yeah. I mean, just like anybody else has like an office job and would write with a pen, we write with them. It's just a fountain pen. Yeah. But I mean, definitely like we're, testing pens throughout the day being that we work in the pen business. So definitely like playing with pens for the intention of writing and getting to know them. That's a little different Then it's less about what we're actually writing and more just like experiencing the pen, gaining knowledge. Yeah. Um, but I'll do some journaling and stuff like that. I do, you know, like at home I make lists, I write, you know, 
all the various things that I write down, you know, I do a lot of things digitally too, you know, especially if I have to like collaborate with Rachel, like grocery lists and stuff. We do that digitally. just yeah, so, so you can, can share it. So we can share it and yeah. whatnot, but it, like quick notes and I write my, a lot of my own notes and so especially like a therapy and various other things. I'll take notes there with a pen so that it slows me down. You know, if I'm ever meeting like with somebody face to face and trying to have like a more meaningful interaction, I'll try to take notes by hand. Yeah, I try to take notes by hand in meetings. I'll bring my laptop or my phone so I can pull up the meeting agenda mm -hmm. and, you know, the official document and stuff like that. But I will usually take notes on paper and then bring them back for a memory thing. I'll write them down yeah. on paper and then bring them back and transcribe them into my computer or my to-do list and stuff like that. But Definitely. yeah, I just always write with fountain pens. There you go. Um, our friend Fiddle Twist writes in this week and says, finally got back to this, the pen cast, and OMG, the Mad Lib. Drew, I don't know how you read it without crying. <laughs> I could never get through reading a Mad Lib without laughing uncontrollably. Get Brian some Puce cargo shorts for Christmas. Done. I don't know where I'm going to find those. I don't even know what Puce is. Is it green or a pink? It's like Some a pale pink, pink. I think. Yeah, okay. Um, Honestly, the, word, the reason I know the word Puce is from Monsters, Inc., yeah. Because he had like different forms or something like that. The yeah. word puce just really stuck in it my came mind. In there, yeah. Good old Mike Wazowski. Tabby4427 writes in and says about ink spillage, because we talked about ink disasters last week. I have six cats and I'm paranoid about ink disasters. So it's literally a production for me to ink up a pen. Make sure I'm alone. Double check. Get the pen cleaned and the paper towel out. Check again for cats. Get ink mm. bottle out. One more check. Uncap the ink bottle. Find cat hidden underfoot. Get rid of cat. <laughs> Squat down and eye level to the ink and slowly fill up. Immediately cap the bottle before doing anything else. Worked so far. Only inky fingers for me. Wow. Uh, I, needed to, I needed to make sure I listed this one in here because it got like 28 thumbs up. Like <laughs> there are a lot of people out there who felt this uh, uh we get we get feedback all the time of people that are like the cat got my tootsie pop again in my order and the cat was playing with the paper or ripped the box open or whatever and it's like people's cats are getting all up in their business it sounds like having a cat is <laughs> definitely uh a way to make sure you're very careful with your ink bottles there you go so and i'm sure samples too because those things get knocked over quite easily oh cats would probably love playing with those so yeah. yeah i'm pretty sure a lot of you are nodding your head right now listening to this <laughs> it's awesome all right. Um, and then finally from uh, Man and Bellier, note to self, don't take a swig of pop as Drew is reading out Pew's cargo shorts. Thankfully, no one was sitting near me. Ha ha. You are both so fun. Listen that's while... Pew, that's Pew's, by the way. No, that's not attractive. It's like a salmon color, yeah. like, a, like a coral, but less orange. I listen while on my walks and I learn and laugh so much. Also, Drew... Hobonichi released an A6 and A5 covers and Back to the Future themes, including cover on covers. Japan release only at The Loft. Thought you would enjoy that. Yes, I had many people send me that. And uh, yeah, I do enjoy it. Everybody that sent me that knew exactly that it would hit my target. And it does. I will probably not be able to acquire one, but it does look pretty freaking rad. Especially the hoverboard part. Um there's some oh my god Pew's Pew cargo, cargo shorts, shorts. He it's found, a thing he's, he found some already it's a thing Folks. all right well surprisingly not that hard to find wow Pew's didn't bring up anything but pink cargo shorts I mean they some of this is look definitely look at this one it's like like quadruple pockets yikes there. some of these are definitely pucy more more pucy than others I don't have a body type for Gary, most of these Gary pucy all right you're up Brian <laughs> Okay. Tell us what Laura, Laura Cheris says. All right, Laura. Oh, I need to check on this. I meant to check on this and I didn't. Oh. But anyway. Platinum does use the slip and seal terminology on the cheaper pens. On the Profonte package, it's noted for sure. Oh, how about that? I meant wow. to confirm that, but we can, we can trust Laura. Let's check our website. Seems trustworthy. We should check our facts, shouldn't we? Well, um, we would need to look at the package itself. I mean, usually we'll have like the copy on the website if it's something that is promoted with the product, but not necessarily always and forever. Um, oh, it does say slip and seal. It says slip and seal on the Profonte, so we were wrong about that. My apologies. Um, what else, what are the pens that we talk about? The Preppy. Let's see if it's on the Preppy. I don't know if it's on the Preppy. They do say that the Preppy can stay inked up for like three years on their it like official that? release or something like that. But we don't have it on our website on the product no. description 
So and they don't yeah, really have any packaging for the puppy. The, the, the plot <laughs> thickens as far as like what the heck is actually considered slip and seal. It seems okay. like it's just okay. Well, they. I mean, all their pens seal pretty well, so... You're... Yeah, Platinum's definitely a great place to go. Some of, it, yeah. so, some of them are technically called right. Slip and Seal, some of them are technically not, all right, but all so... of them do a great job. All right, we need to brush up on our terminology then. We'll, yeah. we'll check it out before... Maybe. Caught us. Caught us remember, we'll check it out caught before us the next <laughs> All right. Christy says, the core pen, the Rotring core that we showed off last time, uh, makes me think... It is a fountain pen that wants to be a Makita power tool. <laughs> That's probably why you like it. I like that. <laughs> it does definitely have a power tool <laughs> vibe to it. Uh, Makita's got some crazy looking tools too. Very, very good. I like that, Christy. Um, all right. Mary X Lupin says that Rotring is wild. The vibe it gives me is kind of dad core, like the dad who has the ultra rugged phone case that doubles the size of the phone. Yes. You would think that I would be into that, but it wouldn't fit in my pockets then, yeah if i did that and i i can't do the clip on the belt thing that's just not i bet you if you did it it would feel, have, like, it would feel pretty good though i, I couldn't you'd nah. be like this is the this is i got a little too much hangover <laughs> on the shorts there so it would be like pressing up on me now another thing that i someone... got like the big version of the phone too so it's yeah. like the big case it'd be like carrying around like an ipad all day. right like nah size too much um I, someone else said that the uh, they love the Rotring Core in the way that they love the Pontiac Aztec. Oh, it's got that vibe, doesn't it? Does. It, it, it does. It does. And as a we four, both owned yeah. Aztecs. Yes. Yes. You say Rotring? Is it Rotring or Rotring? Oh, uh, I say Rotring, but I, I think, don't well, know if that's right. I think it's Rot because in German rotring? the color Rot is red. Oh. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's I'll not, correct it's not myself. Rot. Rotring. Rot. Wow. Roped dad and groom. Dad core. I like and that. And Schwartz. It's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. And then Blue J. Chu says, on parenting, just wanted to let you guys know, I really enjoy hearing your journeys as parents. Our boys are 15, 13, and 11. And I have felt many bonding moments with you as we experience a lot of these phases together. When they get to be 15, it's like sand slipping through your fingers of this precious time as the honor of being with them guiding and leading them 24 seven. It's fun as I hear you enjoying your parenting as much as we do, tough moments included. Well, that's very sweet and I'm glad. Yeah, we do, we I'm do glad. We cover a, a bit of the, uh, the ups and downs there. I just try to balance it out though, cause like for our kids to have any chance of having privacy whatsoever, like we have to intentionally withhold talking about certain things or like showing pictures and stuff like that. And like, that's something I've been very conscious of. No, not me. Our, <laughs> our my, my wife's Instagram is just a hundred percent dogs and children like okay. or child. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah, I, yeah. we have completely robbed him of any privacy. So um, yeah. he might hate us for that later. We'll see. Yeah. I showed the kids more when they were a little younger, but now that they like have opinions and memories, yeah, I'm like, a little less so. Yeah, I, I'll. I think I'm gonna start asking his permission and try to start explaining to him. Yeah. a little bit more about social media. Yeah, it's a good thing. That's like my kids are both in middle school now, and it's like. Yeah. Yeah, these are all things we're very much. I mean, talking if you're about. if you're teaching your kid about physical consent, like you know, hugging and things like that, yeah. you should probably teach them about you know social media consent as well. Yeah. Why not? Yep. Well, that's the world. Uh, uh, this phase right now. Yes. Is... <laughs> It's, it's a more of a mental game, mental and emotional game. Yeah, more so the, the whole sla sand slipping through your fingers, though. Like yeah, I know that's that going to happen, real. but but that 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 visual is like makes me really sad. I'm going to go home and hug him. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I would anyway, but still, like there you go. I'm going to hug him and also be like, ah, yeah, down away, man. It's going quick, man. It's going quick. <laughs> All right, uh, that's it for feedback this week. Let's talk about some new stuff. All right, I got a few cool things to mention. One is the Traveler's Notebook in Olive is coming back. They did this years ago, which actually that's been my daily carry. It it's has been. the been. Olive version. I don't know it why. I have a blue one too, and it's like I should carry the blue one. I but saw it recently. For reason, it, I is, the it, is, it is well It's worn. Used, yeah. It's, yeah. It's well, I mean, I can show it. It's I will shiny. say that it's got some patina to it. So this is my version that I've been carrying around. I keep like three different Goulet notebooks in there. Tomoy River paper. And then I usually keep a, huh, let me 2000, uh, kind of tucked away in there. And uh, I did replace the elastic with this orange one. I don't even remember where I got this. I don't even know if that's a like a traveler's thing specific, but whatever. I replaced it with orange because I like the color pop a little bit. Yeah. So I've been carrying this for probably 
seven years maybe, maybe longer, I don't quite know. Um, so mine's a little more worn in, a little darker, but the new ones that are coming out now, they seem like a little more brown, not quite as dark olive yeah, green. Yeah, that one looks more olivey than the new ones. Yeah, so this was the old version, so I think it's not gonna look quite like this. Yeah, so you will the see- The pictures on our website are pretty accurate. Yeah, we white, did a lot of work white. to do that. The yeah. stock images from Travelers make it look a little bit more green. Mm -hmm. uh, in the hand, it definitely is. Yeah. But it'll darken up a little over time as you handle it, especially with like your hand oils and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it won't green up. To me, it looks like uh, the old Donatello action figures, you know? Yeah, it really does. Donatello was the brownish of the Ninja Turtles. Okay. Um, there was like, you know, all the turtles were a different shade of green. Mm. Donatello was always like pretty much brown, but yeah. like a dark, 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 dark. Yeah, green. yeah, yeah. You're right. That's it's, very, it's a Donatello. Very accurate description. There you go. Yeah. I live in analogies. Yeah, there you go. Um, anyway, $55 for that. Go check it out. We have them available now. Um, we also have a new exclusive Delta pen. So this is the DV original. This is the midsize. Um, we had this pen previously in the blue swirl. So we basically, we, we sold out of those, but we wanted to basically do more. So more do more with blue. So they offered uh, to do a blue demonstrator version of it. So the cap and like the finial and stuff are still that same blue swirl, which I really love. Um, but the barrel itself is a translucent blue. So it's still pretty dark. It's not like high contrast or anything. The blue still looks really blue and looks really matchy, but you get to see the piston inside of there. You can see the ink sloshing around. Um, so that's pretty cool. So we'll have that. It's got a steel nib on it. Um, it's exclusive to us, $292 for that. And we have, uh, like I said, steel nib, extra fine, fine, medium, broad stub and flex. So yeah, we have those available right now. So check them out if you're interested. And the last thing I'll mention, this isn't so much a new product, but there's a new sale that's starting with sailor. So it's called the don't miss the boat sale. <laughs> hey. Nice and punny. Um, so basically they've, this is the third year they've done this. They take the month of September. Um, so starting as when this video launches, September 1st through the 30th, um, they're making it um, uh, permissible. <laughs> to discount uh, sailor pens 40% off MSRP. Um, so normally the, the floor you see is 20% off. So um, not on all sailor pens, but on some of the, um, you know, ones that are being sunsetted and uh, looking to Sunset it over on. the ocean, perhaps? Sunset it, well, yes, sunset over the ocean is, uh, is one of them. Storm <laughs> over the ocean. Um, they're actually, they're letting us do our uh, exclusives as well. <gasps> I know. So we'll have People the Northern Lights, those, Northern Lights Blue and Purple, Stealth Purple. We've got a few of those left. Ooh, Stealth Purple. Um, but we're not reordering any of those. So once they once they go, they'll go, they'll be gone. But there's some other pens. So go check out on our site. You can see the ones that are discounted. Um, and we'll do some email blasts and stuff like that too. But that kicks off today. So right. don't miss the boat, I guess. What about you? Oh, well, Brian. You hyped it up, sort of, last week. Here it is. The Retro 51 Tornado Rollerball in Pirate Party. Pirate Party! I am so excited about this pen. If I remember last week, you said this was your favorite retro design I would, of any I pen, would instantly like ever. I would buy this day one off of any competitor, no doubt about it. Really? This is, it is. I mean, you just, you, you, you ideated this pen. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, so I, can't, like, I came up with the, oh, the, the basic design and the You've concept. ideated other pens too, and it's, yeah, but, the, but this, is, this, this, this is the only good one. So you know? I'm just uh, no, I'm just kidding. No, they've been okay. <laughs> what do you like about this pen? Um, the detail. So when mm. Retro Fifty One did their Sleepy Hollow pen, I was just in awe of Richard cool. Kohler's designer ability to create such a depth mm. using a two dimensional, you know, plane. Yeah. And I immediately was like, I want to do something with that depth, mm. but with pirates. But yeah. I didn't want it to be like scary pirates, you know, sacking a town. I wanted it to be, you know, pirate, you know, something more light, you know, downtime. Yeah. yeah. So here, Family friendly pirates. Yeah. Well, here we have like this is the, like a pirate town. You know, I, I thought about maybe calling it Libertalia, which is the fictional like pirate haven. Um, mm. But I didn't think anybody would get that, so it just went with a very casual pirate party. But you'll see, yeah. you know, three pirates here in the foreground. And then it glows in the dark. So all of the yellow elements uh, are glow in the dark. That's cool. You've got it going way far into the background. Again, the use of perspective is just phenomenal here. Like yeah. 
uh, retro did just the best job. The detail is insane. Cobblestones with shading in the cobblestones. The main pirate's sash and his, or not sash, but his belts have details in the belts. The buckles, the clasps of the boots, the wood grain of the barrels, it's just astounding. And going all the way back, you'll see where the cobblestones end, a beach begins, and then water um, brings you all the way into the horizon line where a ship is silhouetted against a glow-in-the-dark moon, which just, it, it's incredible. It really is incredible. The detail is phenomenal, and there are a bunch of Easter eggs, too. If you look closely, you'll see a collapsed pirate who had too much to drink. He's just laying on the ground. There's a small rowboat there on the beach right next to the water line, and there's even a pirate kind of uh, supporting himself up against a building because he's uh, very clearly inebriated and about to become ill himself. <laughs> so it is just... Never, I could have a stomach bug. You've got, yeah, probably a stomach bug. Yeah, it must you know, be. He might have scurvy. Um, you've got smoke coming out of the chimneys, the stars, the clouds, the shading, and the... Uh, uh, shadows are just all next level. Richard said this is one of the, the hardest designs he's ever had to do. Wow. And I couldn't be more thankful to him for doing this because I think it just surpassed my expectations. And it's blue. And it's blue. Which yeah. is awesome. <laughs> so I could go on and on about it, but pick it up. Um, we've got plenty. So please look. We do, look, but they are moving. They are moving. They are um, moving. Look at the, check out, you know, I'll put some photos up here, but go to the website, check out more photos. Glenn did a fantastic job. Um, we had a nerd on staff that actually had two, you know, pirate era silver um, uh, Spanish reals that he brought in for the photos. Um, so, uh, is you this know, you you're talking those, about? As I also, nerd? yeah, I brought it, those in. I also brought in my son's <laughs> little spyglass without his permission, and he, nice. he 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 took issue with that later. He's like, "Why didn't you ask me?" I was like, "You were at school, bro," or you know, summer camp, whatever. Yeah. Um, but anyway, <laughs> it's there. It's awesome. It's the best thing ever. Buy it or be sad. Um, and then, um, just as exciting, uh, Jinhao shark pens. Uh, we've got three <laughs> new colors of the Jinhao shark, uh, clear, matte green, and matte blue. Brian, the matte green doesn't look green on our website, so I need to go put my hands on that because I It's need... not green. It's like a gray. It is. So it's a gray with a hint of green. I couldn't really see the green, but I haven't seen one it in person like yet. It looks like a shark skin type of a color. Yeah, it's funky. But anyway, those three are new, and I believe mm -hmm. that all of the existing colors, with the exception of those three, are going to begin to make their way back out to sea. So Yeah, they, they, they discontinued those other colors. So if you want any yeah. of the other colors, now is the time to buy those. But mm -hmm. uh, also new colors, so yay for that if you're a fan of the shark pen. Yep. That's it for new stuff. Cool. Let's move on to Q&A. Yeah. All right, Brian. <sighs> Kicking it off with the hard question, Drew. Yo, yo, shamer slam, blam, blam, um, <laughs> is asking, I've found, I've found that even within a brand, the nib size can significantly impact your performance. It's, I, sorry, sorry, it's yo, yo, shazam, kablam. That's, that's the... Pretty much what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what you said. Shabba no. anyway. ding dong. Anyway, go ahead. Um... <laughs> The nib size can significantly impact for performance. I'd love to hear your thoughts on your favorite nibs for each size, maybe even including stubs and some other specialty ones. <sighs> so when I picked this thing, I was like, oh cool, favorite nib sizes, easy. I've got lots of opinions around that. Shouldn't be tough for me. Might be tough for Brian, but he's, you know, that every question is tough for Brian. Uh, and you, I regret my choice. You don't take that into consideration. You're like, this will be hard for Brian, but I don't care. I don't care. That makes me want to put I, it in more. I can give you a simple question <laughs> and you could make it hard. So. But anyway, I do regret it because this is this is a difficult question. So it I'm, is hard. I'm sorry. I had it's a, okay. I'm, I got, thought this would be easier. I've got the pre proper caveats and disclaimers. Good. No, no, no. Here. I don't. I don't blame you for this one because I yeah, I had a I had a rough rough one on this one. But let's just, we can just. Well, talk I'm glad about we it. were suffering together. Yes. On this. Yes. All right. Well, we'll 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 have plenty to be. Your misery is enjoying company today. Uh, so there are so many nibs, so, and I've used a lot, and I didn't. I could have spent hours going through and refreshing my memory with different nibs. Because the way I interpreted this question was not just like favorite pen for each nib size, but like literally the favorite nib size yeah. of a given pen. There's we both interpreted so it the same many way different then. nibs. There like, is. and I have actually written with every nib we have because I do the nib nook, mm -hmm. and it's something like 160 different nibs that we have. It's like, it's more than that. It has to be more than no, that. No, I don't think so. Because there's a lot of pens that use the same nib. Oh, so it's like 160 different. Oh, okay. Completely unique. I see. Yeah. nib style and nib size and stuff like that. Okay. I could be wrong on my math on that one, but it's, I think it's around there somewhere. But anyway, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot to remember. And so I am pulling this from memory. 
So please don't hold me to it. Um, and then I have certain nibs that I really love that could be pretty much in any nib size, like the Pilot Custom Yurushi. Mm -hmm. I love that number 30 nib. Um, the Pelican M1000, the Namiki Emperor. But I don't use those often enough mm -hmm. to justifiably say that they're my favorite. So I'm giving like nibs like that an honorable mention. Yeah, you don't even have an emperor yet. I don't have an I emperor. I keep giving you a hard time about that. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I need to give Rachel a hard time I just, about it. I just got a Yukari Royale not too long ago. Keep up that momentum, man. Work your way I up that I don't have ladder. a custom Yurushi yet. I love that nib, but I just... That, that gets into needing approval from my boss territory. Mm, for I, know. Pen, and it's, uh, I know. It's a tough one. We'll work on that. The more pens I get, the harder it is to justify, especially these expensive pens. Yeah. It's like, um, anyway, so uh, I came up with a list. I did make a decision about every every yeah. nib size I could kind of reasonably think I was think really about. impressed. Yeah, you well, did. Thank you. I started I making tried. my list, and I realized I was copying you almost. For, like I did like <laughs> really? my first three. I'm like, oh, my God, this is exact same as Brian. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can disagree with me. Yeah, I think I might. Yeah. You can just give me a really hard question, not do any work yourself, and then just say that you like my choices. That sounds no, awesome. No, I'll, I'll, I'll work in some criticisms <laughs> in there somewhere. Oh, yeah, okay. don't worry. Don't worry. Don't Fair worry. enough. All yeah. right. Cool. Well, um, started off, I didn't go with anything like too weird and obscure, mm -hmm. because when you get really weird and obscure, there's only like one or two options that we even really have. So it's like, oh, my favorite double extra fine nib is the Platinum 3776, because yeah. that's the only double extra finding we've ever carried. Yeah. So it's like, well, that's not really fair. Well, I guess I just said that. So there you go. Um, extra fine. Gosh, there's so freaking many of them. But I put the Pilot Vanishing Point. Yep. Because for me personally, you like extra fine nibs. I don't generally like them very much because I have a heavier hand and they always feel toothier than I like. And mm -hmm. I like to dump ink on the page too. So um, the Vanishing Point doesn't dump ink on the page, but it's a very, very fine nib, but it's still tolerably smooth. So usually that's a huge compromise, but I think the Vanishing Point does that very well. And Drew agrees. He's, I do. That, 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 that's, that's my, that was my top <laughs> pick. Um, the Vanishing cool. Point Extra Fine is my favorite extra fine, and I love extra fines. Yeah, and I don't mind, you know, a very sharp extra fine, but I have to call this one my favorite because mm. it's, in my experience, the extra fine, the best extra fine that balances flow with stroke. Mm. So a lot of the time, I find that in order to get that fine fine line pens have to sacrifice flow a little stingy. bit. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like the vanishing point balances that line better than any other extra fine out mm. there in producing that true extra fine line, but with as much flow as you can get without broadening that stroke. I just think that it's, and that is such a crazy balance to strike. But I do like the fact that it still feels pretty sharp. You still do get some texture because it's a, it is a very fine nib. So you do get a little bit of that tooth, which I find appealing. Um, but with that flow, I just, I, I find it wonderful. So like, I like the Platinum UEF, you mm -hmm. know, but it's stingy. And the, very the extra fine vanishing point is not stingy, but it's yeah. still extra fine. Yeah. Like that is awesome. Like yeah. I absolutely agree with you on that. And there's a lot of other nibs that are in that sure. range too. Sure, very but, good, yeah. very good yeah. and very close, but I still think the VP takes it. Okay. Good. Um, next one I have, this is another Pilot, but for the fine, I chose the Pilot E95S. Oh yeah. Which I know you're a fan of. Huge. Part of the reason I chose that is because, you know, it's still a smooth nib, but it's a very bouncy nib, especially for, for what that pen is. And then uh, you can actually kind of flex it out and get some line variation. I wouldn't do it all the time, but it's there if you need it. And the fine nib, I mean, you can do an extra fine if you want a little more dramatic line variation on the E95S. Um, but I think the fine is overall a little more enjoyable writing experience yeah. for me personally. My personal one is an extra fine, uh, and it was really close mm -hmm. to me calling it my favorite extra fine, but yeah, yeah I agree with you. I think that that's yeah. a great pick. Yeah. Um, and then so I, I put soft fine in here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I put the pilot Falcon. Sure. Because I don't know how much we specifically advertise this. The only pilot Falcon that is available through pilot USA through, through, you know, official distributorship or whatever in the U S is the soft nibs. They have hard nibs of the Falcon in Japan. So I've heard, I've never used them, but 
I like the soft ones. So, you know, that one's a little bit of a, okay, there's, but it, there's other soft nibs too. Like the Platinum 3776 has some soft nibs every now and then um, that come on some of their limited editions and stuff. And those are nice, but their nibs, Platinum's nibs are generally a little stiffer anyway. Yeah. So their soft nibs kind of feel like Pilot's regular nibs. Yes. So the Pilot's soft nibs, I'm like, yeah, this is cool. I like this. So that's a good one um, is the, the Falcon. And it's kind of an iconic pen too. Um, fine medium or medium fine. There's not that many pens that have them, but I included it because we've had a few. Um, I did the Sailor 1911L. Has to be The Sailor. midsize Sailor, or it could be the Pro Gear. Yeah. It's the same nib, same nib. but the midsize pen in the in the fine medium. I like them. I have, that's actually sort of like my default nib now to get on a Sailor pen that I am choosing to keep. I do want some, I want a, ver a variety, but I have basically one of every nib size now. So if I'm gonna get something just purely for my own personal enjoyment, I'll get a medium fine. Cause it's good all around nib size. Yeah, it is. I wish there were more of them out there. Agreed. Uh, medium nib, this was tough. This is like the nib size that literally every pen so has. So this is your, well, this is your extra fine. Because yeah. for me, extra fine was tough because I love so many love of my extra of fines. Yeah, medium is kind of like my, my It's kind of your default base, choice, like my home yeah. base, yeah. Um, so I couldn't really fully decide. I, I like the Lamy 2000 medium nib. It's very smooth, but I also love the Pilot Custom 74. Like mm -hmm. that was my first, the, yeah. the, my blue 74 with the medium nib. That was kind of my iconic medium nib and it's it's got some bounce to it. That one is not as gushy. Like the Lamy 2000 and the Custom 74 medium are two very different writing experiences. Completely. Like the Pilot one, you get a little more bounce, but it's not quite as gushy and not quite as like smooth. I like the Lamy 2000 because I like, especially if I'm writing with a heavier hand, it'll just take it. Like you can write as hard as you want with that Lamy 2000. That's my pick for medium. Yeah. Really? 100%. Just independently, you picked all these things like um, same as me? When I wrote with the Lamy 2000 medium for the first time, it was a shocking experience for me. Really? Like it was- Wow. Like it's, it's weird. It, like I think, it's hard for me to say because at the moment it was absolutely the smoothest nib I had ever written with. Okay. But that was pretty early on. So, yeah. but my memory of that, and I've written with them since and they're still incredibly smooth. I still feel like it is the smoothest, hmm. you know, the smoothest glide. Hmm. And it's smooth without ever um, b having been over polished. Hmm. And I think that's a big deal. So yeah. if you want a gusher that is also just butter smooth, hmm the medium Lamy 2000, like broad obviously is even more of a gusher, but I think it's a bit obnoxious. The the, the medium yeah. is about as as, as wide as you can go without it being unruly. Well, and the broad on the Lamy 2000 is actually a little stubby. Yeah, very stubby. It's, it's not perfectly it's like a, round. It's like a rectangle on there. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. So yeah, the medium 2000 is just a delightful experience. Yeah, it's good. Tremendous. Yeah, and as I'm doing this list too, I realize everything I put on here is gold nibs. I love steel nibs though. Yeah. But I just, the ones that stood out to me more in my memory just all happened to be sure, gold nibs. Sure. I think as most steel nibs, they're they're either like okay or they're good, mm -hmm. but they're not that unique feeling from each other. The gold is where you get more of that unique kind of feeling. But anyway, I just had to make note of that. You don't have to spend a lot of money to enjoy your pens, but that's just what I naturally ended up doing. So I would acknowledge that. Um, broad, this one I came up with pretty quickly. I like broad nibs mm -hmm. in general but the Sailor 21 Karat King of Pens nib in broad is great. I've got that in a two-tone on a pen that I got the Asian way in Japan. There we go, I know you love that. It's very sentimental. That's the Brian pen. It's a gorgeous looking nib, but Sailor's nibs are usually pretty stiff too, but that King of Pens nib mm -hmm. is bouncy, flows great. It's got some tooth to it. Cause I, like, I will say like, it's a very, justified criticism of most broads that they tend to just be like like on an ice rink right you know you're just like slipping all over the place trying to figure out where to go um but, but sailor's nibs are a little sailor's graphite are, they're a little very grounded yeah. that one yeah so that would that was a good one can't get away from you but i will give an honorable mention to the pelican m600 in oh broad. interesting yeah rachel has like a bunch of those huh. and i was using some of hers and I was like, dang, these are good. They're super smooth. Um, yeah, not quite as bouncy because you can get bigger Sailor nibs too, mm -hmm. or sorry, pe uh, Pelican nibs, like the M800, M1000. That M600 is like a really just good sweet spot of a 
broad nib. So um, I went with double broad. There's not that many of them, no. but I've used a few. Uh, Pilot Custom 912, that's got a double broad. It's great, great nib. It's very broad. Do you prefer a double broad or a coarse? Well, I put, I didn't put coarse in here because there's like platinum or uh, Pilot. 912, yeah. Those are the only ones. Um, they both feel kind of the same yeah. to me. They're both just like massive it's like gushers. A, it's like using a Sharpie. Yeah. It's like they're so, yeah. they're super smooth, but you're like, I have to like use three lines, you know, instead of one because it's so broad. It's yeah. just crazy. But I do, I do love them. They feel awesome. Um, a stub nib. I went super specific on this one. I did the Mark Bacchus CSI grind on oh. the Visconti nibs. Okay, yeah. So it's incredibly specific, and technically it's a custom grind, so it's not, I don't know if it qualifies, but it wasn't, It wasn't. you know, wasn't in the rules here to not have mm -hmm. a grind. Um, but yeah, that one's really good. Yeah, that's like awesome. It. And then last one, the Zoom Nib. Sailor's really the only one that has it, but they're large 21K. Yeah, yeah. The, like, yeah. Not the King of Pens, but the mid-size one. I've never used a King of Pens with a Zoom nib, but I feel like it would just be a lot. So yeah. I like the large the large size. Yeah, I didn't put that one on my list because I don't have a Zoom or mm. a Naganata or anything close okay. to that. So my experience has well, been Naganata limited. Togi, it's like, it's just Sailor. So it's like, yeah. my favorite Naganata Togi is Sailor. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, but, like, but that 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 variable nib, you know, that, sure, the, sure. The, the blade shape. I don't yeah. have any, I don't have any grinds like that. Fair enough, fair so enough. I probably should. Um, but no, that's a very accurate uh, description there. Yeah. So um, it was hard for me because I like, you know, every pen, like you mentioned the E95 and the Falcon, like my favorite version of those are both extra fines. So <laughs> right. it's hard for me to not just want to say extra fine, extra fine, extra fine. Right, right. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mentioned the Vanishing Point extra fine. That that I'm going to go ahead and say is my favorite. Okay. Um, I, as far, as far as the pens that I have that are my favorite, I have a, a Divina, a Visconti Divina from... The first, this is older, so it's before Palladium. They were gold nibs. Yeah, they were 18K. So they They're went- Made by they, Bach, they, I believe. Yeah. yeah, they went gold, Palladium, then back to gold. Right. Um. So back when they were first gold, I have a medium nib on that. And that that specific nib yeah. is just fantastic. It <laughs> is, my, is my favorite medium nib to write with. Um. It it flows really well, but doesn't gush. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's bouncy. It's just, it's just delightful. So that, <laughs> that is my favorite medium nib in my collection. Um, and then, uh, but as far as like overall, no, sorry, fine nib. That's my favorite fine nib. You're then a fine, not a medium. Yeah. Fine. Okay, gotcha. Medium is Lamy 2000. We already talked about that. Right, right, right. Um, so yeah, fine. Sorry. Um, and then abroad, uh, the one I use the most and I don't use it often uh, because I just, I don't gravitate toward broads, mm -hmm. but I do have a broad on my 823. Which that's a good one. I like to yeah, because it's a, it's a it's a high, heavy capacity pen, so yeah. you wanted to put down a lot of ink. Makes sense. And I almost always use a light brown in that pen. Oh, so it gives me a it, lot yeah. of good shading. Yeah, okay. so I want to match it. So yeah, that's, that's kind good, of like that's, that's a kind good of, choice. Yeah. yeah, so that's like like my light brown kind of honey colored yeah. pen. So I just I I, I it's good mentally choice. kind of connect that pen and that nib with that really nice caramel shading. Mm. So it's very pleasant to me. So yeah. I, that's my good, that's my go-to broad. Good mm -hmm. choice, yeah. And then I only have one double broad. I have a, mm. an Edison gold double broad. Oh, okay. And I love it. Yeah. Uh, it's a, just, it just spews yeah. ink, so. Oh, that's gonna be very wet, yeah. Uh, that's I made by Yovo. Yeah. yeah, I don't use it very often, but mm -hmm. man, that Yovo gold double yeah. broad is just a, just a fire hose, man. Yeah, it really so, is wet, it really is wet. Now, my only steel nib, is my preferred stub nib, and that's a Lamy 1.5. Okay. I think if I didn't go with the weird bougie custom grind choice, I would I would go with a steel stub nib. Yeah. There's gold stub nibs, for whatever reason, Uncommon. have always been very finicky for me. Oh yeah, that's like too. either either they end up being kind of too sharp and I can't kind of get them to work comfortably, or you get baby's bottom and you get like skipping issues and stuff. It's so hard to like get a well tuned gold stub for some reason yeah i, I like I'm, I've, I've always been a proponent of the sailor high east neo um I mean, uh, that's a compass guy. yeah so i i like that one a lot but for years and years and years and years and years that lamy 1.5 has been my mainstay and for, for whatever reason i've found 
that those have written for me better than the 1.9s. But honestly, really? hmm. there's no difference between the 1.5 and the 1.9 on paper. Like you can't tell if you put those lines next yeah. to each other, they're almost identical. So there's really no, I don't, I don't know why they people keep buying both, but hmm. um, that is definitely my most used stub and will continue to be my most used stub. Yeah. I think it's just consistent. Every now hmm. and then you get one that leaves that weird middle line down your stroke if like mm. the tines are a little off yeah but it's easily fixable and they're so rigid and stiff like yeah. fixing them is pretty easy yeah i like um, the i like the just yovo number six stub i haven't had as lo good luck with those really? for some reason yeah those and twisby i haven't had as huh. much luck with them um but they're they're fine i think that they they're a little bit more rounded yeah. And I like the slightly more like sharp the, edges of the Lamy. You like the stubs. crispiness. A yeah. little bit more crispy. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Cool. Well, I that wasn't so hard. No, we got there. Yeah. We got All we there. had to do was agree on things. Yeah. Um, but love to know y'all's favorites too. Um, Especially if, like, if you have one nib on one pen that you just think everybody should try. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know. Yeah. We really want to hear it. All right. This is going to be a little simpler question for you, Drew. Uh -huh. All right. This is from Kimberly Huffman says nib creep is it a function of the nib the feed or the ink there you hmm. go sip that coffee well nib creep let's just define that if you don't know what nib creep is you've probably seen it if you don't know what it's called mm. it's when ink finds a way to pool on the top part of the nib the face of the nib mm -hmm. usually it happens in between the tines you'll get like yeah. some spread kind of like oozing up out of out of the 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 slit like uh you know some you know, groundwater or lava or, you know, whatever. Mm. Well, um, I, was, I have a story about that. Oh, gracious. Um, gracious. God, gracious. 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 I don't know what that was. So catchy. Um, I think it was like great or goodness or great. I just invented a new grace. I of like word. it. I like it. No, I don't. I like it. Don't I'm going to bring again. it up again Please multiple don't. times. Let's oh, make God. it catch on, everybody. Don't do it. Anyway, <laughs> nib creep, when ink makes its way to the top of the pen. Sometimes it can happen on the shoulders. It can happen kind of anywhere. Mm. Um, in my experience, it's more about the nib than the ink, but certainly can happen. Oh, yeah. The ink is, is a it's factor. A factor. Yeah. Ink is always a factor. You know, a, a, if you have a nib that has a channel, like basically ink is always going to take the path of least resistance. That's why mm. the feed is specially tuned to just guide the ink to where it wants to go that's why the tines are tuned in such a way that you know it's just it, it's just kind of coaxing it like a shepherd and sheep like hey come on go over here mm. um but if there is a little pathway in the cut of the tines that allows ink to kind of squirrel its way up to the top of the nib the ink's just going to go there too mm -hmm. the tines are cut with a blade if the blade has, you know, not been sharpened properly or is due, due to be replaced or somehow, you know, meets a point in the metal that creates a little extra line or a vein that gives the ink a bonus pathway that it normally shouldn't have, then yeah, ink can travel up to the face of the nib, mm -hmm. especially if the ink is a really, uh, you know, loosely flowing ink or, you know, an ink that just is a very wet ink that just mm -hmm. is very prone to movement. So if you have a more viscous, you drier ink, it might not do that. But you know the wetter inks are obviously going to travel a little Is bit it more. More viscous or less viscous? Oh, I don't know. I always get this wrong. <clears throat> High viscosity, I think, means it doesn't flow a lot. Let me double check this. Anyway, um, so that can definitely happen. It's all about pathways. If the side of the nib has another little like uh, nick in it, or a you know, and these pathways can be totally invisible to the naked eye, but the liquid molecules can certainly find its way up on top. And that is, you know, not as much due to the uh, the feed. Obviously the feed being beneath the nib is what is the main pathway for the ink. So obviously it is a factor, but I would say feed is less of a factor. Ink is kind of a midway factor. Nib is definitely the largest factor. Definitely. And specifically, slid. specifically yeah. how it is cut and how it is, uh, polished i guess if, if that slit yeah. is perfectly polished ink shouldn't be going anywhere yeah. um but you know imperfections here and there the slightest little pathway and the ink will you know deviate from the rest of the herd and go mm -hmm. rogue yeah viscosity is the state of being thick sticky and semi-fluid in consistency due to internal friction so if you have high viscosity it's very thick right if it's low viscosity it's more fluid more likely to move right yeah Gotcha. So um, something like, yeah, you know, uh, a, something up. like a 
detrimentous document ink, probably not going to be as prone to um, pooling or yeah. uh, travel mm -hmm. than something that's more watery, you know, so like a high shade or something like that. Yeah. Less going it's on. Hard to, it's hard to say because there's not like viscosity ratings on any of these. No, inks. but some of them are very obviously full of more stuff. Yeah. I mean, ones that definitely have more. Um, uh, like surfactants to it. Yeah, or like pigment that's, too. Uh, yeah, that's going to weigh it down a I bit. I don't know how the pigment, yeah, I don't know how the pigment factor in. But Maybe we're we, wrong. Who knows? We do, we're not we, experts. We do get questions about nib creep. Some people think, I mean, if it's like really bad and obscene and you just can't stand it, okay, but it's not actually hurting anything. Yeah. Like it's literally just, I know it's kind of annoying, especially if you like dip your pen and then you're trying to like wipe it off it after just you stays fill forever. it. And it's yeah. like, you just keep pulling ink from the, the slit. You're just like, Sometimes, sometimes if you, if you, you, you can wipe like straight down the slit. Oh no! Sometimes I like I'll like, I'll wipe left and wipe right and like just don't go near. Just don't go near the, the slit? slit. Yeah. And then you're usually okay. Sometimes I don't know. I don't care. I literally don't even pay attention to it I have, anymore. I have because one. It's just, who cares? I have you one know? that only creeps on the right shoulder. Interesting. Yeah. So there must be like a little nick or something yeah. like on the right side there. How about yep. that? Yep. Huh? Weird. It happens, but don't sweat it. Like Man. honestly, like. It's so like the the level of like how fine of a like nick there must be there for it to nib creep is like it's not even anything you can see with your eyes. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're kind of fighting a losing battle. And I don't even know if they would consider that a defect at the most manufacturers because it's not affecting the function of the pen. It's purely aesthetic. Yeah. And so we always advise if you have nib creep in it, like it's just really bothering you, you know, try switching to a different ink because then, you know. It's like Drew said, it's mostly the nib that's causing it. But if you switch the ink, it can it can help. Some inks are definitely more likely to creep than others. So. Correct. Just like people. Cool. All right. Question number three <laughs> coming from Serendipity. Mm. Brian. Yes. I love listening to you talk about the great work environment y'all have created at Goulet. Enough that it cool. makes me want to work there. Sadly, the climate in Virginia might medically kill me. So my question oh, is... What is your advice for people who are longing to work in a business with good work environment such as yours in terms of things to look for when applying for positions? Mm. Red flags, critical questions to ask. I'm sure Drew might be able to speak to this as well since he came to Goulet from a toxic work situation. Yes, mm. he did. You might actually have better perspective on this than I do. <laughs> well, yeah, but you, you, you've you intentionally, you know, cultivated, you know, this environment. Yeah, so, I know um, it more from the side of being the interviewer. Yeah. And I will also say that I didn't really ask any of these questions to you when I got my job here, so. No, you didn't. Um, And yeah, so. We had previous relationship. That yeah, you, you knew I wasn't that. gonna steal all your stuff. No, I didn't have anything worth stealing at the time. Um, it's So. Some, some dye mine. Yeah, this, <laughs> I will say this is tough. I haven't interviewed or done a job search for myself since my internship at college. And then I went and worked for my dad, power washing houses and cleaning carpets. And then I started making pens and then Rachel and I grew it into this. So I, I don't have a lot of professional interviewing experience. Um, so really the only interview experience I have is hosting, like, like performing interviews as an interviewer here at Goulet. Yeah, and which, which we take very seriously. For sure. I mean, we take it, yeah, we do take it very seriously. We have an HR director whose sole job is just to help with stuff like that. Um, she has a lot of other things. That's not her sole job. But um, yeah, so I'll give you my perspective, especially the perspective of somebody who's looking for someone to work in an environment where culture is very important. There's a lot of really important aspects of things that we look at that other companies might overlook. So I can talk about like, what are the key things I'm looking out for and what kind of like keys me in to when somebody interviews I know that we're kind of dialed into the same frequency, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so best thing I would say is learn what you can in advance before doing the interview. See what they say about the work environment on their website. If they post their company mission and values, check their social media, see if it feels real, see if it feels consistent with what they put on their site. There's a lot, I mean, these days, like especially us, we're an online company, we post tons of content. If anybody's interviewing here, and hasn't looked at our website and doesn't really know that stuff, I'm like, what are you even doing? Like, yeah. why are you even coming to this interview? Like just, it's so easily available yeah. to look this stuff up. It's like, this is where you're gonna be working like maybe 40 hours a week for the foreseeable future. Like do a little research, you know what I mean? So just 
do some research for the company um, because their stuff is so available. Um, there might be certain awards that the company has gone for that can be an indicator. There are some very specific like company culture related rewards. There's like great place to work, top workplaces. You know, we've gone for things like small giants and they have like more regional and local ones that you can do. So anything, anything where there's a, there's a lot of like kind of BS awards too. So, you know, you have to kind of filter through those a little bit, but you can just see kind of through what they say on their own like media page in terms of what matters and does that also kind of match your values and stuff like that. Um, make sure that your values align with that company's and look at the ownership structure too. You know, if it's a really fast growing like Inc. 500 company and they're trying to take it public, you can probably bet that it's going to be a very hard working, lots of hours, sacrifice a lot of your personal life, personal time, you know, because they're trying to grow and scale and move fast and break stuff kind of environment. Um, so, you know, pay attention to that. That's not neither good nor bad. It's just if it's not what you're looking for, it's not going to be a great fit for you. Um, whereas if you have like a like us, we're a smaller family company. We're not growing as rapidly as a lot of other companies. We don't have outside capital. So we take things in a much more kind of organic approach. So you know, it's going to be a more personal kind of more close knit feel, but we're not like rapidly changing our org structure all the time. Like you might in a larger company. So different vibe and that fits for some people and not for others. Um, I would say like the size and the maturity stage of the company matters. Um, that'll kind of indicate the natural pressures that will happen on that company. So if you have like an upstart, that's like scrappy and risky and all that, they're going to change things a lot, you know, if you are more into stability, maybe go with a company that's a little more mature in their life cycle, not growing as rapidly, you know, that's going to feel more stable. Um, you know, again, like the size, like bigger companies, you know, could be more stable, but maybe a little less personal, a little more politics and those types of things. So, you know, pay attention to that type of stuff. Um, me personally, like there are sites that you can look at like Glassdoor and things like that, where you can see like you know, previous employees and what they've said about the company, those can be helpful, but they also can be very mixed because, you know, it's kind of like looking at Yelp reviews and stuff yeah, like that. I was about to say the same thing. You can thing. get some very kind of sensational stuff or, you know, people certainly might post vindictive things that maybe are not 100% accurate, but at the same time, like people can post whatever they want. Like I can't, I can't make a request to Glassdoor to have anything taken down. So right. it's like, I, as an employer, I'm kind of like, well, I hope it's all good on there because it just is what it is, yeah. you know? So take all that with a grain of salt. You can look at it as a baseline. If it's like all bad reviews and you're like, oh, maybe that's, maybe that's not a great sign. And certainly there's things like Better Business Bureau and stuff like that, you know, organizations that like you can file complaints with. And if they have like bad ratings on places like that, it's like, ooh, maybe I should second guess that one. Um, so that can be a, a data point. Um, so onto your question about like, what are some good questions that you can ask, right? So these are things that you can help vet whatever the company. Um, a lot of these might be kind of customized to you and what's important to you. Um, but ultimately just kind of make, make sure that you're, you're asking thoughtful questions to make sure that it's a good fit for both of you. Um, so I would say start with having any questions at all. Like the number of times where people have come in and they have zero questions. And I'm like, really? Like we've had one interview and you don't have any questions at all. I'm like, that's kind of weird, you know? So it's like, if they haven't done this much of their research or they're, you can tell that they're kind of like phoning it in a little bit and whatever, or they're not that motivated, but you know, maybe they're somebody else in their life told them that they need to go interview places. And so they're kind of going through the motions. It's like, yeah, you can kind of tell that. So just in invest some time, have some questions uh, for whoever you're interviewing with. Um, you'd be surprised how many people don't do that. Um, do your homework. You know, interviews are totally different if you've read the website. Um, and followed what the company does. It's definitely like, especially like we're a small company. I put myself out there a lot. And for somebody to come and interview, you know, I'm not even gonna be honestly at the first stage of the interview. We usually do like a phone interview and then we have an initial interview and then like a group interview that we do. So it's like several stages yeah. that we do to put the people through to again, make sure it's gonna be a good fit. Um, but it's like, I founded the company, you know, I'm out there. So it's like, if somebody like is interviewing with me and doesn't have any questions, I'm like, really? Like I'm a wealth of knowledge about what is this company? Like have some questions. Um, so yeah, um, let's see here, what else? Um, you can ask about the, the company's origin story. That can be really, 
really interesting and very mm-hmm. fascinating. Maybe tell you a lot about, you know, what it was going on. Um, you know, try and do your homework on that ahead of time. Um, but h- how the values were defined, that's a good one, especially if the values resonate with you. You know, asking like, how did y'all come up with your values? Or, you know, what do you do to ensure that your values are something that are actually upheld in the company? You know, do you is that something that you interview for? Is that something that you, you know, check in on when you do development reviews and stuff like that? That can give you a big sign into like, their culture and how much do they actually incorporate the values into what they do as a company versus like, it just kind of sounds good. And you've got the like poster on the wall with an Eagle soaring, you know, saying leadership. Yeah. That's my, that's my number one, what you just described. Really? Applied values. Yeah. That, that is, that tells you so much. Yeah. And asking about how they came up with them. Like for us, it was a team effort that took months, maybe a year. Yeah, it, um, took a while. it took a long time and it, the whole company was involved at every step mm-hmm. and discussion after discussion, whiteboard after whiteboard. Like it was such a wonderful collaboration to have been a part of. Mm-hmm. And to this day, you know, probably, you know, uh, you know, eight years later or something like that. It was um, 2014 and we did all that. So, yeah, it's nine years ago, nine years later, uh, the values are being upheld. Like those are how we mm-hmm. make decisions. You know, we filter them mm-hmm. through those values. So they yeah. are absolutely applied every day in the decision making processes. So that does tell you a lot. And yeah. it tells you that those sorts of, you know, community uh, decision making tools are upheld and utilized. And mm-hmm. that just kind of signals a more collaborative environment overall. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Um, uh, asking like how the goals are defined and measured, you know, this might be kind of role dependent. Um, so you can get more specific to that role. You know, it might look different if you're a bookkeeper as if, as opposed to if you're like in a sales or marketing role. Um, but certainly asking like, how are you going to measure how good of a job I'm doing? Um, that can be very telling as well. Cause if they're like, Oh, we just kind of like feel it out or whatever. And you're like, Hmm, Okay, I just have to make sure they like me in this job. But if it's like, okay, we do, you know, you have one-on-one meetings regularly. We have these certain metrics that we look at for this role. We have quarterly offsite meetings as leadership to set the goals for the coming quarter. And then those map to your own objectives and stuff like that. If they're that awful about it, you're like, okay, like I can work with that. I feel like I know what I'm, what I'm kind of be going to be measured up to. That's a good point. You mentioned the goals. And I think that flexibility is a good point to bring in here because while flexibility with the individual, like, oh, well, you're sick. It's okay. Oh, you're sick again. It's okay. Like, you know, you need to have some hard lines there, but flexibility in terms of the goals, I think Mm -hmm. is a big deal. And something that shows that your company is willing to adapt to the environment around it. And some companies are just kind of like stuck in their ways and settled regardless of what's happening to their industry or the world economy or mm-hmm. you know the you know the social economy mm-hmm. um, that flexibility is key and asking about that like how you know when do your goals change how do they change like we have an you know it's sometimes annual sometimes less than annual um, mm-hmm. thematic goal which obviously mm-hmm. we have we have our values and our company mm-hmm. mission statement and things but our thematic goal is more time and place. Like sometimes, like during COVID, obviously we had a very different goal, but everybody right. knew what that goal was. Everybody, mm-hmm. it, it was presented to everybody with the thematic goal and then defining objectives beneath that uh, thematic goal that showed like, if anything goes up against these things, then that's not what we need to be doing right now. Mm-hmm. And that changes. Obviously you can't be focused on the same thing during a pandemic than you would be pre-pandemic. Like it needs to change. You need to have you know flexibility in terms of the company's direction and what's most important right now. And a company that acknowledges that that flexibility is important is going to be a better company to work for and a much mm-hmm. less stressful company to work for. Yeah, you could certainly ask like, what are your, what are your goals right now? Like, what are you all focusing on? Yeah. You know, and like differentiate between current goals, like, you know, oh, well, we want to optimize profit and be like, okay, but what's your goal right now, yeah, like, specific to now? Yeah. Like what are, what opportunities are you saying no to so that you can focus on your current goals? Exactly. Cause like, that's honestly, that's the biggest, I mean, that's why you have company values. That's why you have a mission statement. It's not so much that it tells you what you should do. It's, it tells you what you shouldn't do because you'll have more opportunities, you know, as a successful business, you'll have more opportunities to say no to. Um, and then I said, uh, you know, this is, uh, a common question that gets asked to interviewer interviewees 
but you can flip around and ask as the interviewer, you know, where is the company heading in the next three to five years? You know, the kind of classic, like, where do you see yourself in 10 years, whatever. 10 years is ridiculous. That's way too far out. Five years these days feels ridiculous. So three years, five years, somewhere in there, you can feel it out. But just asking like, where do you see the company going? You know, just to show that like you're invested, you're curious as to what the company is doing and how you might kind of be able to fit into that. A key like mindset thing when interviewing, especially for a very like conscientious culture based company, you don't want to go in there thinking about like, how is this company going to serve me? You know, it's very symbiotic. It needs to it needs to serve you and meet your needs, but you also need to serve the needs of the organization that you're that you're becoming a part of. Um, but in the interview, you really want to make sure that it comes across that you're in going to be invested in what the company is doing as a whole. So focusing a little more on that, especially in the early stages of the interview, don't walk into the first stage of the interview and be like, "Well, how much time off do I get?" and when's the vacation pay and how many sick days do I get? And all this, that, and the other, if that's like what you're leading with, that's not a great indicator as to like how, you know, excited you are to actually do the job. Um, unless you have, you know, sometimes there's extenuating circumstances and people will say like, you know, I have X, Y, Z going on or like we've had people interview before, you know, and it's like, they're a great fit, but they're like, I've already scheduled this thing with my family and it's happening. So it's really important to be able to get this. And it's like, okay, cool. That's like, you kind of a special thing. Um, and then honestly, just be naturally curious and invested. You know, if you submit a resume, don't have a different company's name on it. We get those where you can tell that somebody had like just copy and pasted, you know. Oh, so they're like applying from, to Goulet, but saying like, I've, I'm super excited to work oh, yeah. at Exxon. I'm so excited. To, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's definitely happened. Have more than you might think. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, oh, it happens. No. It happens, and oh, that's like no. you're not going to get through the door if, oh, you, no. if you if you do that. So you got to be you got to be a little thoughtful about that kind of thing. Um, um, but yeah, just naturally being curious and invested, and in, and as you're asking questions, just being curious as to what's going on. Um, and then I said like, yeah, avoid the self-centered kind of questions. Like, how often do you get pay raises, or how much time do I get off? You know. Those things are important, but honestly, when it comes to interviewing, especially for a company where culture and fit is so important, you don't even want to talk about benefits until you see like, are we even on the same page? Like, is this even a potential fit for both of us? Um, you know, the company and then and then an employee. So it's like, once you kind of establish like, okay, there's there might be something here, then you'll you'll get a chance to talk about the benefits and all these other things. Um, so if it's if it's if it's a, just a job and you're just looking to get a paycheck, okay, go through the motions, you know, answer those questions. You don't have to invest as much into that. But if it's like a place you really love, you know, culture is important. You're gonna have to invest some time and energy into that interview and uh, and really vet them as well as they vet you. So kind of broad, kind of general, but hopefully there's some good stuff you can pull. Now, honestly, if there. all future applicants should listen to this because uh, I really should. If if someone right. comes in from here on out, if anybody interviews with us and doesn't do all the right things, they've got literally no excuse. Well, like because a, this is on the internet <laughs> for everybody. Well, so like a good example, <laughs> a good example. So my my assistant Jen, I don't think she'll mind me sharing this. I don't have the chance to ask her about it right now because I just thought of it. But you know, when when I was looking for an assistant, I was like, "This is somebody's gonna be working very closely with me." So I want to shoot a video for the job posting to say what I'm looking for mm -hmm. and give a sense of my personality and what I'm gonna be like. Well, she stood out in the interview because she shot a video of herself there saying, "Hey, I'm Jen. This is me. This is you know That's whatever." That's a big deal for her because she's pretty family. introverted too. This is, she's very introverted. Yeah, but she was she was matching. Yeah you know, what I was putting out there. And she, you know, she showed me like how she organizes her calendar and her schedule and the cork board thing. And she's got, you know, family organization and all this type of stuff in her current. And I was like, I have a much better sense of who she is now. And then that just got off on the right, on the right foot. So was it more work to do that? For sure. But, and she was stepping know, outside of her comfort zone for sure. She was, but you know, she definitely stood out in that way. And now she's been here for, Seven years. And she's, so. a, she's a great <laughs> compliment to your style as well. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. That worked out well. Yeah. Um, I think that's really well said. I couldn't agree more about the applied values portion. Um, you also touched on work-life balance. I think that's important mm. to understand. Yeah. And, and it is a balance. You know, No company can just give you time off whenever you want it ad infinitum, you know, but that balance is important. You have and to I work at some point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, But so getting to that aspect is always good and helpful. Um, as far as red flags go, 
I would say that uh, something to keep in mind would be to, I don't know exactly what sort of questions you'd ask, but if you do get the opportunity to talk to a person in a leadership role, um, figuring out whether or not they view any of the company's success as a success on their part or a success on their team's part, I think is important. And that's pretty mm. easily identifiable, I think. Mm. I think that you might just kind of pick that up naturally yeah. you know, by you know context clues. But the best leaders out there and the most um, team-based leaders view, you know, uh, there's that, you know, comparison where they, you know, look out the window to give credit and look mm. in the mirror to give blame, yeah. not the other way around where, you right. know, you look in the mirror to give credit and look out the window to give blame. Right. You want to make sure that you're joining a company where the leadership team or the, you know, individual in, uh, in charge views the company and its success as an entity larger than themselves. That's where you will find the best leaders and the best, you know, uh, support leaders, the best service leadership. And that's that's important here. You know, servant leadership mm -hmm. is a big deal for us. We yeah. don't any of our leadership um, team members here don't view themselves. And I and it's probably might sound, you know, like fluff, but it really isn't like the leadership team here is much more of a support team than a directorial team. And it shows in the way they approach problems. It's never my success or I did this. It's always like I helped my team to do this. Mm -hmm. Any success in terms of leadership is a support-based style of success. Mm -hmm. It's it's lifting up. It's coming beneath and helping support. Like it's you know cheerleading or being a you know good pit crew member, helping sure making yeah. sure that things are tightened and buttoned up and well oiled. Like mm -hmm. that's the style. And then when yeah. the team succeeds, that's that's your yay moment. Yeah. Um, but that's we have a team based culture. So that makes sense. Other cultures, it's much more individualistic and they wouldn't have those same values. No. So it, it's, a lot of it depends on what you're looking for. Yeah. You know, if what you want is a team based culture, you should be asking about the things that make it a team based culture. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of general, like we're making a lot of assumptions here based on like how our culture is. And th I that, mean, obviously that would be, that was the kind of the nature of the question. Yeah, I mean, so, we, yeah, we know sense. what we know what we like and that's the way we do it. But yeah. Um, you know, it, yeah, it depends on your preference. And some companies I don't really have the option to do all that either. Just, mm -hmm. you know, by nature of the, you know, the job itself, it, it differs vastly depending on like, if, if you are a uh, like, you could have an office job where you are a you know tech support person. Like you're gonna have way more, you're gonna have a different sort of potentials in that environment than you would if you were a you know traveling you know HVAC technician. So it, it the potentials is going to be different mm -hmm. depending on what uh, career path you're in. But I thought of another red flag as you were talking. Yeah. Um, don't talk bad about any of your previous employers. Oh yeah. Um, even if there was a bad situation and there was stuff that wasn't your fault, if you have a lot of like kind of blame going on, that's kind of a red flag. It is. You know, it's kind of like if you're in a dating relationship and the person's just talking bad about their ex and all that, you're like, well, what if I'm the ex in the future? You gonna talk bad about me? You know, yeah. it's like kind of like the mirror in the window thing that you just mentioned, Drew. It's like if somebody, even if somebody wasn't treated so great at a previous thing, there's a way to say it without making it sound so accuse it and we noticed that in interviews like that. you oh, know we've sure. both been in where we we knew that they were that they wanted to say something negative but they yeah. they paused they thought about the best most diplomatic way to say it and then they expressed it in a very yeah. neutral way and then afterwards we're like oh wow that was that was you could tell that something went down yeah. that didn't that was a little rough but they sure. but they, they they were careful and professional and courteous expressed what they needed to express you mm -hmm. know by answering what question they were asked but mm -hmm. didn't add any unnecessary vindictiveness yeah yeah that's a word right vindiction vindiction i don't know i don't think that's a word vindictivity i don't know anyway none of those sound right none of them um <laughs> and then something i keep in mind as an employer who interviewing, um, keep this in mind, the best indicator of future performance is past performance or future behavior is past behavior. So if you have some, for example, if you have somebody who's got a 20 year long career of changing jobs every 12 to 18 months, there's a good chance that's probably going to happen it's at your place too. Pretty big sample size. You know, not, not, not always, but it's just, you know, something to keep in mind. So again, that kind of speaks to like, if somebody's talking bad about their previous role, or you're asking about, questions about like, well, what are some mistakes that you've learned from? And they're kind of 
skirting around that or kind of turn that into blaming somebody else for something, you're like, oh, so that's what they're going to do here. They're going to blame others for things, even if it yeah. might be their fault. Your, or, empl your future employer's you know. <laughs> impression of you is 100% of the context you provide them with. Right. So if you provide <laughs> them with that context, they're just going to assume that mm -hmm. you're going to be like that in the future because that, that's yeah. all they have to go on. Mm -hmm. You know, you are working with an empty bowl. They have an empty bowl in front of you and you are choosing what you are going to put in that bowl. And then afterwards, they're going to look at that and be like, okay, mm -hmm. this is that person. Yeah. And it's, it's depending yeah. on what they're looking at is what you yeah. provide them with. So don't but provide them with anything you don't want them to, you know, don't kinda... like, don't embellish, don't lie, don't do any of that stuff because all that stuff comes out at some point. Oh, yeah. You know, but there's definitely ways to, there's ways to say things that are more appropriate or that are more mature and thoughtful than, you know, just even if they're, even if you had a challenge or a bad situation, not, not sounding petty, you know, taking some accountability to the situation and speaking about it, you know, in a, in a thoughtful way it really goes a long way in an interview. Yeah. And be genuine. I find that if you are just honest yourself, and genuine, you will get that in return from the person that you're interviewing with. Mm -hmm. I know that personally, when I've had an applicant come in, if they are just very natural, relaxed, and genuine, you know, being honest, if they mess up, it's just saying they messed up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I recall there was an interview where someone was um, beginning to answer a question, and they, uh, you could tell that they kind of forgot what the question was. And then rather than just continuing to kind of BS their way through it, they stop and be like, I'm sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought. I need to start that again. Like there's a type of person that'll do mm -hmm. that. And then there's a type of person that would just be like, I don't want to, I don't want them to know that I forgot the question. And they'll just kind of like just kind wing of it. Trail on and you're yeah, like, like, no, be, be honest. If you, this? if you yeah. say like, I'm sorry, that kind of sounded dumb. Can I, can I try that again? Like, just say it, be sure. yourself. Like we're all humans, you know, and that sort of honesty makes me as someone, you know, who is, you know, interviewing, mm -hmm. be more honest in return. And then you're going to get more out of it. You're going to get the real version of the person you're interviewing with out if you kind of, you know, if you bring that to the table, mm -hmm. but don't bring like too much of it, but the, sure. it's, it's a balance. Sure. Just be yourself, but the, you know, the, the, the professional self. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> cool. All right. All right. I got one more question for you, Drew. All right. Curating cute art. Oh, if you had unlimited money, what would set the limit on your personal pen purchases? Oh, uh, wow. Good alliteration there. <clears throat> yeah. So that's a tough one because I just, I, I. Would you set a limit? Here, Unlimited money. I've been Unlimited money. I've been asked before, like, you know, do you think you could spend a billion dollars and like how quick? I'm like, I could spend a billion dollars in a day. Like it would, like I would you buy. You'd be surprised. It'd be harder than you'd think. Do you know how expensive certain movie props are? <laughs> No, I don't. <laughs> like, I would buy the Batmobile. I would buy the DeLorean. I would buy the Ecto-1. I would buy, like, no. A billion would, dollars is a lot of a money. A billion dollars is a lot. It's so a lot yeah, of may, money. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe I would have a hard time. But I would. I, I could burn through some. You know, I certainly could. <laughs> You'd be up for the challenge? I would be up for the challenge. If it were so, offered to you? So, yeah, I would not. <laughs> I can I can buy some dumb crap, Brian. So, but, here, but here's the thing. It's a lot of dumb crap. It is a lot of dumb crap. But here, here's the thing about pens, though. I love, I very, very, very much love fountain pens. And... I would not want to, um, if I had unlimited money, I feel like I would, and I'm already like this. I've got about 40 pens, I think, you know, a little, little more. I, I like that number. I don't want to really go above that mm. number. There, there's, they make 40 pen cases and that's mm. a pretty common max. Mm. Um, and I think that's just a really good number. And I'm at the point now where I feel like going above that makes me not value what I have quite as much. Mm. So if I'm already at that point where I want to make sure that my collection retains its kind of emotional value to myself, if I had unlimited funds, I'm sure I would feel that way as well. Mm. I would probably want to stick with 40 or fewer. I would use a pen case to do that mm. with. I would use a physical pen case. Um, in fact, uh, there are a couple of really nice 40 pen cases out there that I think are great options. And you've got um, companies like uh, Toyoka Craft who makes those you know, mm. beautiful wooden boxes. I, mm. I, I might finally, if I had unlimited money, I would finally buy one of those, by the way. 
Um, and uh, I might go to 100 because they've got 100 boxes too. But either way, I would use a... a <laughs> whoa, whoa, you're jumping right to 100? That's a big difference. I'm just saying, I'm just saying they, they've got some really cool looking boxes. Well, um, you know, if you had unlimited money, Drew, somebody would build you like a thousand pen no, boxes no, or no, something no, no, like no. that. I wouldn't want that. No, I could stick with. I could definitely <laughs> stick with forty. I I feel like that's a that's a good number, hmm. and but I I want to continue to love my pens as much as possible, and you just can't do that if you've got a bazillion pens. Like I know you've got a ton of pens, but what are you trying to say? Well, you your your collection Not a bazillion, but I'm getting your, there. your collection I'm has a, has it. a has a much different purpose. Like does, you don't have a, an emotional connection with all of your pens. Not all. But of if them, you no. if you were to pick your like the pens you are, mo if you had to save some of your pens from a fire, a very very slow <sighs> fire that was slowly creeping, you had plenty of time to go through all of them. You're not gonna, you, you'd be able to pick out the ones that are most meaningful to you. Yeah. So I, I feel like that's the same thing. You're in danger of not mm. having the ones that are most meaningful to you if you just buy everything you see. Mm. So. I think a pen case would do the job for me. I would keep everything in there. And if I wanted to get a new pen, I would have a one in one out policy. Hmm. How many pens do you have right now? Do you know? And no, I don't. Is Someone, it, I think when is I it did less than 40. No, it's more than 40. So but, you would see that to pare it down. I already. could pair. I could pare it down right now. Yeah, yeah. Easily. But I keep, I keep trade pens, you know, I'm like, okay, you know what? The, these, I have, uh, okay, a, I, got I have about seven pens that could be traded right now. Okay. Um, that you'd be okay. Yeah, absolutely. Out. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, so yeah, if I needed to go down to forty or below, I could do that. Yeah, I could pair my collection on quite a bit too. If I sure, had to. but like you, you, your, uh, if you separated your Brian as the business owner pens from Brian yeah, the pen enthusiast very, pens, they, yeah. they'd it would look very different. I have. You, you might know, have like two safaris in there. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I probably have. I don't know that I could get it down to forty. That mm, would be tough. That would be tough. But I could get it down to a hundred. Yeah. Of like pens that actually like really mean something. To yeah. Me. And most so, of them would be like one of a kind, like the artist proof on a pen that we co-designed, like that kind of a thing. Yeah. Like it would be more like personally meaningful, like one of a kind type things. So if you, you know, were not the owner of this company hmm. and did have infinite money and, you know, obviously still were a fountain pen enthusiast. Hmm. These are so many hypothetical situations. It is. Yeah. You have more, you have more to apply than I do. <laughs> okay. Then what would I what would I do? Oh, yeah, how would, would you how would you not buy all the pens? Oh my gosh, um, I will say, like realistically thinking about if it was just like oh infinite money, the idea of just like buying able to buy whatever you want is fun for a little bit. Yeah, but it would quickly get old because you would just you'd be like oh I can just okay I'll just get well I'll just get five of those. Yeah, Why you're not, not nearly as you know like acquisition hungry as I am like well well I guess yeah I guess it's more it, it's more rewarding when you have to like really work for it yeah you know what I mean 100 you know like look at just there's so many examples of like you know people who are very wealthy and can basically buy whatever they want they become very dissatisfied with things that were like oh my gosh that's preposterous how you could ever get bored with such a thing it was like jack donaghy in the in the in the in the, in the lunar lander right exactly you know? yeah <laughs> exactly or like jeff bezos is getting rid of his yacht and he's commissioning a 500 million dollar custom yacht yeah. and i'm like what well, your old yachts like not good enough anymore like yeah. getting bored of yachts and like <laughs> Like how sad in a way is that? Yeah, that that's you. It requires that much for you to get excited about something. Yeah, well, it's kind of like know? it's kind of like you know, uh, getting uh, developing an, a, a a resistance to medication. You know, you yeah, just have bit. to keep it's a natural upping yeah. your dose again. We naturally and again and again. get used to things, and then you yeah. Know, so, you know, that said, it's a bit ironic because I can get a lot of. I have a huge pen collection, but. It's almost like I I consider myself more of like a librarian or a historian for the company. Yeah. So my my own connection to my pen collection is very different than it would be if I was just me with something. But you have you definitely have you know added pens to your collection for two reasons. One mm -hmm. because Brian Goulet, the pen nerd, yeah. likes this pen and wants to have it. Right. And B. I should keep this one in case I need to reference it later. Like the you, ones that are, yeah, the ones that are like, this is important to keep for historical right. reference. Those are the easiest ones to like, okay, I'll just throw that in yeah. and I'll do it. And I'm not as emotionally tied to it, but sure. it's a function of the business. And I, I appreciate being able to reference those pens and stuff like that. What, what percentage of your collection do you think 
is the Brian the Pen nerd got this because Ooh. I just want to have it. Like, sure, all of them have potential like, yeah. uses, but what one was... There's a number of them that cross into both. Yeah. yeah. Well, but like, the ones like, that are like <clears throat> only me, the pen nerd, I've read no, I, I would like say very maybe, little justification. Maybe, maybe not only, but ones that are primarily, like, you know, 70-30. You know, like like the... Uh, yeah. The Yukari uh, Royale you just got. Yeah, that, that one, one is that one's very Brian. Yeah, like, yeah. sure, it'll it's applicable. You will sure. reference it maybe, but you really wanted that. Or pen. like the Pilot M90 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Like, I bought so, that because I was like, I really like that. So, uh, of those, you know, do you think you have about a hundred of those? Yeah, yeah, it's probably ten to fifteen yeah. percent of my collection probably would be falling into that category. So I don't think that's too crazy at all. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, I'd have my box of 40, you'd have your box of 100. Okay. Solid. I can go with that. All right. I could work with that. So next time I'm at a pen show, should I buy two of those Toyota Crafts <laughs> boxes with the uh, company card then? Mm. Buddy? Yeah, pal. once I get some unlimited money, <laughs> we can make that happen. Uh, but I will say that, no, naturally, this, this situation for me will have a limit because Rachel would set my limits because um, I don't know that I would actually be able to set my own very well right she would she would set the limits the thing is pens are really small though so you can you could really get a lot of pens and it not really get in the way i don't know That's you also, dangerous you also save pens. a lot of your boxes though I get rid of a lot of my boxes. I, I saw those things in the warehouse. I know. That's, There's like, that's the pared down. God. I have, uh, how many is it? There's like three big bins full of boxes no, in there. No, it goes deeper. Too. Oh, <laughs> it's two, it's two. So I have like, it's that big, like 18, yeah, 18 yeah. quart tubs. So basically at this point, I'm only oh keeping, I'm only keeping pen boxes where it's like a sample of pretty much anything. So it's like, I'll keep like one Lummy box, you know? But if it's a if it's a limited edition or something where the packaging is special and it's yeah. like a numbered pen or something like that, I'll keep that. So those are just pretty much the special nice nicer yeah. pen boxes. Wow. And I think I have, I would have to count it up, but it's it's like eleven or twelve of those eighteen quart tubs filled with oh. em empty pen boxes. Oh, I think I only saw like four. Yeah, it no, must it, go it really goes deep. deep. Oh, it geez. goes deep and it's layered and yeah, it's there's a lot there. Oh my! I'd actually move it to a different part of the shelf because it wasn't as like supported by as many like, oh my brackets. god so i moved it to a set anyway oh, it's geez. a whole thing all right so yeah it's i will say the more pens you have the more it is to manage them which does mo kill, pens mo problems which does kill some of the joy when you have to keep a spreadsheet and you're like where is pen number 762 some people love spreadsheets though some people do love spreadsheets so maybe that's oddly gratifying for you but you can keep a spreadsheet with any pen collection if you want that's true. really really down to it um okay so that's it for q a this week you can definitely ask us questions in the comments or you can email us at pencast at gulepens.com if you're an audio listener and uh coming up next here drew we've got interview with mr rick shaw we do. Um, since <laughs> i just attended the san francisco pen show it got me thinking that last year at the san francisco pen show i had the opportunity to sit down with mark dwight of mm. rickshaw bag works and interviewed him, interview him about his origin story and how he switched from the things he started into the the pen world. And it was a great, great chat with him. My camera work was pretty abysmal, so <laughs> apologies for that. The miking on Mark was good, mine was non-existent, so the audio version of this might not be quite as good as the video version of this. But mm. uh, we are going to put it up, and um, you can uh, take a listen because it was see, pretty awesome. He's got I a thought, great story. I thought you had a good opportunity here to pass it off as this. You just interviewed him. Like, we haven't been sitting on this footage for oh, a year. Oh, no. I've been sitting on it for a year. <laughs> but it's all very valid. His origin story has not changed. Right. There you go. Um, so we're going to insert that in here now, and I uh, hope you enjoy that. All right. Well, let's... Let's rewind to the beginning. So uh, when I was uh, much younger in high school, I started my own stained glass business. And uh, I have I've always kind of been into craft. And so my parents had moved to a home where I was able to have a little shop off to the side. So I had, a, had woodworking tools and got interested in stained glass and uh, started making stained glass windows. And so um, stained glass is a process of cutting glass creating a design, cutting glass, and putting it together with lead. So uh, fast forward through a career in high tech, back to where I am now, um, or have been for the last 20 years now, it's like been quite a while, but you know, here I am cutting, cutting fabric and putting it together with thread. It's a, there's, a, there's a weird parallel to it, it's very similar. Glass and lead, fabric and thread, here we are today. 
Uh, in between times, um, I was a mechanical engineer. I studied at Stanford uh, as an undergraduate and later went back for a business degree at Stanford. Um, I grew up in Silicon Valley. My father was an early Silicon Valley pioneer in the laser business. He was an entrepreneur. He started the first commercial laser company, a company that went on to commercialize the barcode scanner that we all know in supermarkets. So um, I grew up around high tech, you know, chips and lasers and, and all, the, all that stuff that you uh, hear about, about uh, you know, Silicon Valley and technology. And I myself had a 20-year career in tech. And so I worked for a number of startup companies. Um, I worked uh, for some large companies. I was uh, the last part of my high tech career. I was in a startup that was acquired by Cisco Systems, the big networking company. So I've been in companies big and small, worked for, for um, venture capitalists, uh, and I've worked for big corporate executives. So I've had a, you know, a, a nice survey of work environments in my career. But the work environment that I like the best is the one where I'm the boss and no one tells me what to do and it's a small business. And so uh, I left Cisco in 2001. Uh, I had been in an acquisition. I had been with Cisco for four years. I had vested some stock. Uh, and 2001 was the year that the first dot-com bubble burst. And uh, Cisco had been on an absolute tear. Stock price had been going up. We'd been growing. We'd been, we were making more acquisitions. We're making an acquisition a week at, uh, at Cisco. It was the go-go years, and it came to a screeching halt. We had our first layoff. Our stock plummeted from $89 a share to the, to the high teens in a matter of months. Um, and uh, I went from being the toast of every cocktail party I went to to the guy who worked for the company that was threatening everyone's uh, college tuitions and, and, uh, and uh, vacation homes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so it is, you know, feast and famine. Yeah. But, um, but I wanted to strike out on my own. So I um, took that as a, that sort of inflection point in the economy as an opportunity to professionally uh, take a break. I took a year off. Um, and during that year, I decided I wanted to start my own business. And something that I've always been passionate about is writing and writing uh, in, a, in a notebook. And I was a big fan of Moleskine notebooks. And at the time, Moleskine was relatively new. It's uh, pr pretty interesting. I mean, that company has been an, an incredible f uh, success over the years. Um, and uh, so I, I thought maybe there was an opportunity for another brand of notebooks. And so I embarked on a project to create my own brand of notebooks. Uh, I moved to San Francisco from Silicon Valley um, and, uh, and hired a design firm and started working with them to develop a line of notebooks. So we got to the point where I was ready to go to manufacturing and I needed to find a printer and I thought that the place to print these would be in Hong Kong. And so I reached out to a friend who was doing business overseas and said, hey, I'm looking for a printer in Hong Kong. Can you help me find one? And uh, he said, I don't know anything about printing. And, uh, and frankly, he wasn't that interested in my project. But he, did have, he had an investment in a small company that was looking for a, a new inv a more investment and really needed an, some new management. And he said, I got this investment in this little bag making company in San Francisco called Timbuktu. You should take a look at it. And by his mind, I was a, I was a young uh, professional with a lot of potential who wasn't doing anything other than trying to start my own notebook company, of course. Uh, but he said, take a look at Timbuktu. Maybe you'll be interested in it. So in fact, I did. I met with uh, the Timbuktu team uh, and decided that there was a real diamond in the rough. It was a small company doing about $4 million a year in sales. And this investor group um, had had some institutional investors. They wanted to grow the thing and sell it. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm up for that. And so I joined the company um, as an investor and the CEO. Um, I ended up running the company for three and a half years. We, we grew the company and sold it to a private equity firm. I subsequently left the company about eight months after the sale. And here I was again at another, at another juncture in my career. What did I want to do now? And I still wanted to do something entrepreneurial and, and frankly, still wanted to run my own business. And so this time I decided, you know, I really enjoyed making product in my own factory in San Francisco with Timbuktu. I think I'm going to start my own sewing factory. <laughs>
This is a guy who has an MBA from Stanford, by the way. <laughs> what on earth? <laughs> Why on earth would he do that, right? You, Aren't you, you smarter than that? <laughs> did you ever like, like, tell yourself, like, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't listen to that entrepreneurial spirit and just go with something a little bit more CEO-y and a little safe. more conventional. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, my father was a was a very successful um, entrepreneur, and his company, Spectrophysics, became a four hundred million dollar company. It was ultimately it was it was publicly traded. It was actually taken over in a hostile takeover by a large company in Switzerland called Siba Geigy. Um, so I was I was uh, front seat. I had a front seat to a lot of corporate drama in my life, um, but I also had a very high bar around what, what is a success as, a, as an entrepreneur and success as an executive. My father you know, ran a very large company and subsequently ran two more companies. And um, so I've always measured myself to that standard. But at some point, you know, I kind of got a grip on my own psyche and said, you know, it's really not about what my dad has done. I need to do, follow my own passion. And my passion is is not to be the king of the bag business. It's not to be a Silicon Valley executive. Um, it's not to be one of these guys who starts a startup that ends up going public or selling for billion dollars. You know, I mean, that's great and all, but I know how rare it is, and it's not. It's just not my aspiration. Um, I have much humbler aspirations. Uh, those are that I want to be. I want to be a. I like making things. I want to be in the in the business. I want to participate in the making of things and. And frankly, I want a business that I can run on my own, on my own terms. And all of those other uh, careers, being a corporate executive, um, being an entrepreneur in a venture-backed startup even, you know, that sounds very entrepreneurial. People are like, oh, small company life. You know what? It's actually not really a small company life. You're working for a very large corporation called venture capital. And the venture capitalists like any major corporation where you might be a man manager, even if a senior manager, you're working for a board of directors, if you're, and you're probably working for a senior level management, and even if you're the CEO, you report to a board of directors who reports to the shareholders. You're not your own boss by any stretch of the imagination. Only a few are. A few executives have retained majority shareholdership in their, you know, Elon Musk, um, you know, um, a few, right, Facebook, uh, so, uh, so it's not all, you know, you're not the master of your own destiny. You're only the master of your own destiny in a really small business, right. as it turns out. So and that's so what that's what I decided. I decided a small business was the right place for me. I'm constitutionally unemployable uh, at this point in my career. And I have the luxury of being far enough in my career where I have had all those experiences. I know what I like and what I don't like, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at, what I can tolerate and what I can't tolerate and what people can tolerate in me and what they can't tolerate in me. And part of that is me not being able to work for them. And so, um, so I decided to start my own small business. And, but even starting this, I kind of had some pretty big aspirations for it. And along the way, I've kind of dialed that back a little bit because I've decided that it's as much a lifestyle decision as it is a business decision and a career decision about what I want my life to be like in my own business, in this case, rickshaw. And, uh, you know, I'm far enough along in my career that this is probably my opus. And, uh, and so I want to enjoy it. And I enjoy really being very intimate with the process, with the product, and with the, with the end user uh, in terms of how, you know, that relationship. Um, and so small business is really the way for me to be able to do that personally and not get too far away from it. I don't want to be just the manager who manages the business that makes the products that we sell. I want to be in the business. And a common criticism of small business owners, if there is one, is that they spend too much time in the business and not enough time on the business. But that's a very, that, that perspective is one of the, the, the measure of success is growth. And I don't believe that the measure of success is exclusively growth or even requires growth. Um, you can measure success and growth in terms that are not financial. Growth can be in knowledge. Growth can be in satisfaction. Growth can be in doing new products and generating new ideas. And to me, that's personal growth. I, I don't, I have the luxury of not having to 
uh, shall we say, you know, force Rickshaw to be a bigger company. My kids have already gone to college. I already have a car. I have, a, I have my own home. I don't have any aspirations, any wild financial aspirations. So I'm, I'm free to run the business in a way that, you know, obviously I want it to be profitable so that it's sustainable, but I'm not, but I'm not motivated by making it bigger for the sake of making it bigger. I'm motivated for making it work for the sake of being able to come in here tomorrow and you know have my people get paid and, and be able to do it again tomorrow. Right. And mention, so yeah, mention that thing you were talking about, about like why soft goods. And so um, and then and then a big part of my my aspiration is to actually be involved in the process. And the beauty of the business that I have found myself in today, not high tech, not a business that requires investment in tooling and equipment and and long arduous development tasks. I'm in the soft goods business. And soft goods are, are remarkable from a product development standpoint because they're very, it's very easy to prototype products. I can have an idea in the morning. I can come into work, create a quick pattern. I don't sew myself. I, hand, I, I can, but I don't. I, I hand it off to my sewers. They sew up a prototype before, before lunch. And I can have, I can look at it, and after lunch, I can ask them, here, make these changes. And by the end of the day, I can have the second iteration of a new design and be using it the next day, be thinking about what, it, what it's ultimately going to be and make those changes. Within a matter of a couple of days, I can have a brand new product ready to go to market. And so um, that is fantastic. There's no tooling. There's no capital investment. We, we've already made the investment in sewing machines and people here. And so the process of coming out with a new product is very rapid. You've got to have the idea. You've got to have the, some intimacy about what you want to do. But once you know what you want to do, you can get there really quickly. And that's, that is the most gratifying thing as a product developer, to see their ideas come to life so quickly and not have to wait around. OK, when's the tool going to be done? What if the tool's not right? Oh, we've got to go through another iteration. It can take months. Here it takes literally hours. If, you know, in days to do stuff. And so that's, that's super cool. And I love that. And I love being involved in that process. Um, and so uh, this, ha it, you know, I've, I've fallen into, I, you know, through my, the twists and turns of my career, I've found a, um, a place in, 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 in uh, the business world that really suits my skills. I'm a mechanically minded, mechanical engineering oriented, person who likes to work with their hands. And so this is just ideally suited to my personal interests and my, uh, and, and, and my personal, um, you know, my skill set. So. Well, at what point did you come across the fountain pen community? <laughs> so why pen cases of all things, right? The beauty of this business and me owning it outright and not having to answer to anybody is I can make any products I feel that I want. Uh, and so um, I make backpacks and, and shoulder bags. I mean, we all carry bags. And so I make bags for everyday use my own, from my own perspective. Um, I make, uh, I'm, a psych, I'm a bicycling enthusiast, so I make some cycling products. And about five years ago, um, well, maybe six or seven years ago, I started uh, backing some projects on Kickstarter. And I was backing projects by makers. And those, some of those makers were pen makers. And one notable one was, uh, or two notable ones, were Machine Era and Keras, Keras Customs. Both Machine Era and Keras were sort of my gateway products. I backed their, pro their projects, got these pens, and I'm like, wow, these are really cool. Now, these were not fountain pens. They were rollerball pens. But they were makers. Machinists had their own shops, just like me. And they were making stuff that they were passionate about. And I was like, I love this. I love this jam, you know, this maker jam that's going on here. And Kickstarter, what an amazing platform. If that platform had been around when I was starting my career, look, I, I, I predate the internet in my career. So, you know, um, we didn't have this, uh, you couldn't just like go on Kickstarter and start a company. You know, you had to really, you know, go get some money and, you know, that's why venture capital exists. But today, the ability to go be on Kickstarter, start from scratch, basically. But anyway, I got really interested in these pens. Well, Keras ultimately did a fountain pen uh, Kickstarter. So five years ago, I found out about this San Francisco pen show. Had no idea, but of course, every, every niche has its, you know, its gatherings. 
And so I said, oh, cool, you know, Penn Show. And I found out that Karis was going to be there. I'm like, oh, I want to meet Bill Karis and Paul, who, who is uh, also on his team. And so I went to the show really to meet them. And so I go into the Penn Show and I'm like, oh, it's like overwhelming for all, for all of us who have ever been to our first Penn Show. We know how, how intimidating and overwhelming it is. And uh, so I'm like, yeah, I was kind of unmoored by the whole experience. But I made my way to the Karis booth. I chatted up Bill, looked at what he was doing. And then I started looking around at some of the other booths and some of the really expensive pens. Now, as a bag maker, I've been making laptop sleeves and primarily for Apple computers for a long, long time. Apple, Apple users are very particular about the, the fit of their sleeves. I learned early on that many fabrics are abrasive and so if sliding a computer in and out of a sleeve uh, you know, every day can wear off the paint on the outside of a computer. So, Early on, I had started using a, a specially soft material inside of my computer sleeves, a, a, a plush material from the toy industry. And so I had all the materials to make really soft cases. And so I look around at the pen show and I'm like, oh my God, people are spending as much money or more money on a pen, a single pen, analog writing device, as they are spending on a, on a laptop computer from Apple. And I'm like, the, the, and the light bulb moment for me was, you know what? These people need laptop sleeves for their pens. And so I came back and I, I, I made that, the first little uh, sleeve that we have. You know, it's shaped like a taco. I was like, how can I make this super simple with the techniques that we have and the materials we have? And I concluded that I could just make that kind of lozenge shape, you know, put plush on the inside, a fabric on the outside, bind it, fold it, bind it again, and boom, I had a sleeve. And then, um, and so I tried it out, gave it to some people, they liked it. Um, I then kind of figured out, huh, I could, if I put two of these flat together and sewed down the middle, I could have two pens in there. And so that was the duo. And then, <laughs> and then I made, and then I thought, oh, if I put two duos together and I have four pens and I, I called it the Clover. And I took it to, uh, to the pen meetup. And the first thing someone said to me was, well, what if I only have three pens? And my first, the first, my flippant answer was, buy another pen. <laughs> but, but then, of course, I was like, eh, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a rude thing to say. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. So I actually figured out that I could take two of them, put a third one on top, and then fold it up and make a three pen. So we made the trio. But anyway, that little design exercise was really fun. And basically from this single elongated thing, I developed not just a one pen sleeve, but a two pen sleeve, a three pen sleeve, and a four pen sleeve. And that became the first line of pen sleeves from Rickshaw. The, the, the single pen sleeve, the solo, the duo, the trio, and the clover. We, I was gonna go with quattro, but it was like, sounded weird. Uh, so then um, I started seeing, um, you know, now I'm on Instagram and I'm getting involved in the pen community. I'm looking at all these pen photos and I'm watching people cram their pens into pen cases. And I'm like, what? This is like f fingers on the blackboard to me, right? It's like, what are people doing? You're buying these beautifully polished pens. And in fact, you're buying them because they're so beautifully polished and colorful. And then you're jamming them into a case, you know, cheek to jowl, you know, pen clip to pen clip, scratching each other up. I'm like, ah, oh, I can't stand this. So I, I really came at it from, I'm in the business to protect these pens, not just to transport them. And so most of the cases out there were for transporting pens and for transporting pens of the stationary variety. You know, you just throw all your uniballs in there and all your colored pens and boom, you know, it's just a, it's just a case for keeping them all together. But I really wanted to make cases that not only kept them all together and provided safe transport, but that were, that were, that kept the pens in their factory fresh condition. That's what I, I like to tell everyone now that I'm broadening out into knives and things like that. Look, if you want patina on your, that tool, it should come from using it. It shouldn't come from storing it. If you're getting patina from your storage system, you have a storage problem. And so I don't want my cases imparting patina on your precious pens, knives, whatever other EDC devices you're putting in them. And so my whole philosophy has been about, uh, you know, as we say for pens, uh, we say uh, a pen, a slot for every pen, uh, no touching, clips in, nibs up. 
okay? And that's for the fountain pens. But more broadly, every device ha deserves its own slot. You know, if you want to, if, you, if, if that's not your jam, that's fine. But that's, that's the perspective we come at it from, that we want to help you keep all your gear in factory fresh condition or whatever condition you want it to be in. Because the fact of the matter is, most of this stuff will ultimately get resold. And the person is going to evaluate its value based on its condition. And if we can help you keep it in pristine condition, then your collection is going to be worth more over time and it's going to be more easy for you to buy, sell, and trade as we do in our, in our world. And the person who's the recipient of, your, of the pen that you have today will be grateful that you kept it in a rickshaw case and, and not in something that, that allowed it to get all scratched up and banged up. Nice. So uh, anyway, so I get to follow my passions Pens, you know, we, I went down the rabbit hole with the rest of you guys out there, and here I am today making pen cases, and I love it. It's really fun. Um, I love the community. Um, you know, we, we go to the San Francisco Pen Show because my, 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 my show is very hard to take on the road. We, you know, it's one thing to load up a briefcase with $100,000 worth of pens and be able to travel with it and carry it on. I got to, you know, what, what they can put, in, what pen dealer can put in a briefcase, I need a crate. My volumetric efficiency on dollars per volumetric, you know, is, is for, for volume is really low. And so I think about, I had two truckloads of stuff I took to San Francisco, barely, barely made it back with, the, with all the boxes. And so to, for me to go across the country and do this is really difficult. But when I go to, the, I'm, I'm so glad I'm here in San Francisco, the fun pen show, because you know, we do some fun stuff there. We have our fortune cookies with prizes in them. Uh, we like to launch a new product there. We do a t-shirt. Uh, we kind of do, we've taken it upon ourselves to do the show swag. Uh, and so, uh, and it's just, we have a really grand time and we've just come from the, from the most recent show and it was a lot of fun and I'm already looking forward to next year. But, uh, you know, that's what I love about it. And it's a lot of great people. It's fun after hours in the bar talking about pens and cases and all that kind of stuff. And um, so, you know, it's running my own business. I can pursue my own passions and I can do it in a way that suits me and I don't have to ask anybody's permission. And do I always make the right decision? Maybe not, but I make enough of the right ones and I do it by, my, um, by myself. And so I enjoy that. Uh, this this company is quite small. And, uh, you know, I have a sewing team of eight people and I have two people that help me in the office. And that's it, that's rickshaw. It's not a big operation. So, uh, and that's, and then I found that that's my sweet spot professionally. So I love it. Fantastic. All right. Well, a very belated thank you to Mark Dwight for that time nice. spent with me. Um, and uh, that has not aired before. We're not just reusing an interview that we showed last nope. year. It is never before oh, seen. So yeah. um, I hope you enjoyed that. I always love hearing his insight and his story. He's really got a cool ton guy. of experience and the fountain pen industry is really lucky to have him in it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we can uh, scoot on into what's happening. Yeah. If we have things happening. I think so. True. All right. I went to the San Francisco Pen Show, Brian. Yeah, I want to hear all about it, man. I did. Well, let me just start by saying I intended to take more video and more photos. Like, when, yeah. I, when I was on the way there, I'm like, oh, look, it's the Richmond Airport. Oh, look, I'm in the airport. I'm walking. Yeah. And then, you know, like, I, vlog vlogger style. I, I did some stuff and then... As soon as I got there, it's just like pfft, nothing. No, you're just like, yeah. I just talking it just, to people and it did. It it, it hit me. Um, but mm. the the way the the flights there really kind of sucked. So mm. <clears throat> got got to the Richmond airport. They did the whole thing. We're like, all right, this flight's gonna be really full. We'd really like to have some volunteers to gate check their bags. I knew I was flying Delta through Atlanta, mm -hmm. so I thought to myself, you know what? It's Delta. It's Atlanta. That's their hub. They, yeah. they should be fine with my checked bag, right? Yeah. I, sure. I go ahead. I volunteer. I'm like, you know what? Team player right here. Drew Brown. Check me out. There you go. Uh, check my bag. And everything you went know. smoothly and you were rewarded greatly for yes. that. Right? Yes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, get off the uh, flight in Atlanta. Bag's not there as I thought it would be right there on the jetway. Right. But no, it wasn't there. They're like, oh, yeah, that, that'll be. We're going to. The flight was delayed, by the way. Um, mm. And uh, I had to run to my next gate. And I said, <sighs> hey, where, where's my bag? Oh, your bag. And I said, it, it's leaving in 10 minutes. They're like, oh, no, your bag will be there before you will. You need to run. I was like, oh, okay. So I guess they're putting my bag on the on the jet. Um, mm -hmm. I barely got there. I was like the fourth to last person to board. Mm -hmm. The uh, team at Franklin Kristoff was supposed to be on that same flight as well. Oh. They all missed it. 
Oh, um, gosh. it just barely. Um, so yeah, it was Jeez. all the flights were delayed that day. So I'm I barely I'm made so much about this. Yeah, lately. I barely made it. Um, but apparently my luggage didn't. Oh um, gosh. Got to San Francisco. Luggage was nowhere to be found. Um, Kimberly, all the hobbies on Instagram. Uh, was there ready to pick me up. Um, Brian Weaver from Iron Feather Creative uh, was there. We we're going to both ride with Kimberly. I had to make them wait because I have no bag. Right. Went to customer service. They're like, oh, yeah, that's in Atlanta. So, Oh, my gosh. That just anyway. just never made it on the plane. No, never made it on the plane. Awesome. So that was great. I will say, rewind a little bit. One good thing did happen on the flight. Okay. I had my coffee and my Biscoff cookies. Mm-hmm. And A, I dunked my Biscoff cookies in coffee, which I had never done foolishly. And it was Why amazing. Not? Because I'm an idiot. You're a dunker, man. I know. I would have thought you would have been fool. on that train a long I'm time a ago. I'm a fool. I know. So wow. dumb. But now so I know. So you've been eating dry cookies this whole time? I mean, they're still good. But they yeah, are still good. Yeah. I'm, I was a fool. Now I've seen the light and it's amazing. Oh. Um, but uh, I drank my coffee and ate my cookies immediately while the lady was still there. Mm -hmm. She looks over and she was just like, oh, you want, you want some more? And I said, yeah, so she just gave me another cookie, another pack of cookies, another nice. pack of cookies, another coffee. So that's awesome. That's a little hack for you. Just Dang. eat everything really quickly, and they'll just realize you're starving and wow. give you more. Um, I sat next to a a father and a two and a half year old who was very well behaved for a two and a half year old. He got yeah. pretty squirrely in the last thirty minutes, but sure. still two and a half. Like, psh, yeah, he did fine. I opted not to watch, you know, something inappropriate on my screen. It's thoughtful um, of you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> The dad told me I didn't have to. I was like, no, it's fine. Watched Paddington and oh. Paddington 2. I've heard Paddington's really good. They're phenomenal. And the, the yeah. dad, was, dad was like, uh, seriously, you don't have to. I was like, oh, no, I love Paddington. Paddington 2 is a work of art. So <laughs> I, I did that. And it was delightful. Nice. Um, anyway, got, got back, had no luggage. Kimberly and I um, picked up uh, Mike from Ink Dependence. And oh, yeah. the three of us tried to go to In-N-Out, which was too packed. So we went to Taco Bell instead, which was absolutely glorious. I was not having a good time, Brian. I was a little distraught. Mm. Um, Were you there with no bags? I had no bags. But you, you can't know brush what, your teeth. But you, you know what I did have? Underwear, like... I did have five crunchy tacos and <laughs> 10 packets of fire sauce. Oh my gosh. And that just soothed my soul. Wow. All was well in That's that good moment. good you had that after you were off the plane. That could have gotten uncomfortable. It gives me strength, Brian. <laughs> it, it just It is a panacea for what ails you. <laughs> So I got wow. to the hotel, uh, sat down and, and took my tacos and uh, had a chat with the uh, gentleman from uh, Flax Pen to Paper, which is a California-based retailer. Mm -hmm. Just the nicest guys you could ever talk to. Love them. And then just uh, waited uh, until about 4 a.m. Eastern time. Oh, gosh. And they finally delivered my bags. I didn't have to go get them, so they did deliver them. But well, that's good. I thought about going to sleep, but I was just distraught and i was like gonna go to sleep like and like in my jeans in your, i guess in your clothes i don't know yeah i'm like okay i guess i could with your taco <laughs> breath i could try to go to sleep but like i'm, I'm gonna be miserable they're gonna so, wake you up anyway right like, i don't know how it would have worked but anyway uh, i finally got them it was kind of a mess but wow. uh yep yeah. um the next day the ben show started it just kicked off mm. blitzkrieg i got a you know overpriced muffin from the lobby and there went and started doing the thing mm -hmm. Um, immediately saw just dozens of people that I like, love, and just enjoy talking to. <laughs> uh, I did go back to the lobby for lunch and got a uh, some ramen out of the vending machine. Ooh. They had a ramen machine. It was That's pretty cool. good. That's it was cool. pretty good. So um, the day was great. You know, saw a lot of um, great vendors, a lot of unique things. Uh, luxury brands had some guests from Waldman, Germany, mm -hmm. there at the show, and they had one person actually engraving their live that you could watch. Uh, she was cool. etching the uh, Zetra model, and, you know, engraving images, names. Mm. So that was really unique. Uh, at DC, they had the pilot kind of hand testing thing. I would say like the equivalent of that was probably the Waldman, okay. the Waldman lady doing the engraving. So that was neat. And a different, a, a different, different flavor. I think that the uh, I, I've kind of settled on the fact that the main attraction to both the DC and the San Francisco mm -hmm. shows are modern fountain pens, of course. Okay. But kind of the B side to the DC show, I feel feels like vintage fountain pens. Oh yeah. The B side to San Francisco feels kind of like stationary. Mm, so okay. I think that attracts a certain type of kind of B-side customer. Yeah, okay. And it changes the dynamic. So I, I do feel like there, you know, the San Francisco kind of show kind of had to, has diversity on its side. You see much of a, a wider variety of, you know, people come from coming from different 
places in the hobby. So mm-hmm. it's it's definitely a more lively, upbeat, um, you know, uh, higher energy show, which yeah. which I enjoy. Yeah, DC has energy, but it's mostly because it's like a fr- it's anxious, a fr- frenzy, anxious, yes, frenzied, exactly. Yeah, energy as opposed to like excited. Yes joyful energy exactly and i definitely There's saw still that. plenty of that too but you know sure yeah. sure but i, I do there is diff- a different vibe it definitely feels different it's hard to put your finger on but i've been trying to describe well, it a little it's very bit. classically like east coast versus west coast i think so you know? yeah <laughs> um so uh i uh, went out for burgers uh for dinner that night and then i got back and in the hotel lobby i uh saw you know my friends uh, uh sherry cheryl and marianne they were there and i got affogato with them for the first time last Ooh. year and nice. I'd never had it before, and it's like the best thing ever. So, of course, they were like, hey, we need to get Afogato again for you, Drew. I'm like, oh, y'all are the best. So what is that again? It is essentially just uh, you know ice cream with some espresso over it. Oh, yeah. Um, it's divine. So they so waited for me. Like avocado. Is yeah, right. exactly. Every time they, they waited for me. So I showed <laughs> up there, and uh, my good buddy Abby was there with uh, Christine. Christine. Not Christina. Everyday Explorers um, was there and uh, Job, whom I met, and he's, he's my new friend now too. So I had dessert with all of them. That was delightful and magical. And then um, finally went to bed. And uh, the next morning I woke up and got this great greasy spoon breakfast. At uh, I, I looked at pictures. I was trying to find a good breakfast restaurant because I didn't want Lobby Muffin again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I found a place called Peter's. And I looked at the I looked at a picture that someone had taken and the mugs were brown mm. and the plates were like an off white with a brown rim i'm like that is what i want there you go. and i think i saw a picture of like canned corned beef hash i'm like that's my place i don't <laughs> want anything too bougie anything too hipster like this needs to be a greasy spoon diner yeah um and uh yeah it was great because uh, i went with um annabelle from uh, opus Cineris and uh aiden bernal who is just a delight and annabelle of course is from the netherlands so she you know bless her heart asked for English breakfast tea with milk at this place. And the guy just looked at her like, uh, you, you want green tea? Like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> She's just like, yeah, that's fine. Just tea. <laughs> and she, of course she didn't get her milk either. So it was just, Gosh. yeah. Yeehaw. <laughs> um, so that was, that was nice. And then, uh, I went and picked up your uh, faceted vanishing point. So you've yes. got, a, you've got I had a, a show purchase without even going. You've got a vintage vanishing point now. So that was, that was yes. delightful. I think I gave away almost, 200 stickers to people I met there, Brian. That's amazing. I think I brought like, you know, 189, something like that. And then more because I met Mary who designed some of our stickers there and she kind of reloaded me because I was out of stickers at that point. Wow. So I I met so many people and I wish I could list off all the people I met and had the opportunity to chat with, people that I had chatted with on Instagram and finally met for the first time, people I had known from last year and got to see again. It was just a delightful experience. Just so cool. The engaging with you know my friends was just a treat. Engaging, meeting new friends, having, and I've I told a couple of you that I'm going to look into that camera next and know you're there, and I'm doing that right now. So thank you so very much <laughs> for that. Um, there was a uh, a theft that um, was pretty pretty yes, prevalent. That, this that, is, uh, that made the news. Getting, getting talked about a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so yeah. So it made the news. You know, and and unfortunately, pen show thefts are. Not uncommon. Not uncommon, unfortunately. Right. Although this was the first time that uh, someone was apprehended at the event and uh, removed um, by the authorities, so wow. uh, that was a pretty big deal. You know, I kind of you know can't not mention that it was definitely you know noteworthy for sure. Wow. But uh, hopefully, having you know the apprehension occur will uh, dissuade future pen thieves um, because it's just it's just such such a counter community action yeah. and a lot of trust in the pen community there really is and that just like completely obliterates it, that it does that and so, you know a, a you know a table like pilot like with namiki emperors out on the table like yeah. they're they're risking a lot allowing mm-hmm. the community to hold and write with a pen worth multiple thousands of dollars yeah and that that's a huge trust but it, but it's a trust in the community and in you know them giving the opportunity to us to be able to do that and it's just a shame when someone kind of takes advantage of that so yeah. Um, either way, you know, that was a thing, uh, mm. it was unfortunate, but, uh, I believe all the property was recovered. So at least oh, there's that, that's you good. know, doesn't always have a happy ending, but, uh, yeah. th- this year it did. I, I would, obviously we'd like for it not to happen at all, but, mm. um, 
after uh, dinner on Saturday night, I got to uh, stay up way, way late and build Gundam models with CY. He <laughs> brought awesome. two boxes from Japan. Oh, my gosh. And says, like, Saturday, we were building Gundam. And uh, we did until way late. And then nice. I got, like, four hours of sleep and oh, got gosh, up. But, wow. um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that um, a couple people, I, I got to see uh, um, um, my friend Ned has a whole pen case full of nothing but pens made of impero celluloid which i've showed you it's that blue really rare yeah, celluloid yeah. dude's just an impero nut so hmm. i got to see his stuff which is fantastic uh, my buddy craig was there my pal brianna i got to meet karina for the first time nadia was there and all of the amazing amazing pen makers and nib technicians and when i say amazing i don't mean that they're good at what they do they certainly are but they are just the kindest most generous delightful mm. people and i'm just so thankful to have them in the community and um yeah, the trip home was fine. It was early. I left at five and uh, uh, left my headphones in the in the room. So Aww. that was a bummer. What was more of a bummer is that I called them and said, yes, I'll, we'll ship them to you. No problem. Like, oh, yay, great. The cheapest shipping option is $27. Mm. And these were $70 headphones. So they're not the most pricey headphones. Like if they were $300, I'd be like, absolutely. Yeah, $27, sure, sure. i will pay for them. Just, you know, oh, I don't have to buy $300 headphones again. But mm. they're 70 bucks. They're just... They're, they're corded. They're for gaming because I don't right. want any, like, you know, I just plug them into my controller that is right. in my lap, so I don't need them to be wireless. Right. But they're Turtle Beach. They're decent enough. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, it's still cheaper than buying them new, but, I, like, it stung. I'm like, yeah. God. And Did you get it shipped back to you? Yeah, I paid. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, like, it's always tough when it's, like, half the price. Yes. Or like, cl- like, more than half the price. You're right. just like, ugh, it's still cheaper than buying it new, but, like, yeah, it, sucks. it burns it sucks. a little. Yeah, so that was that was a bit of a bummer. Dang. And then I got back. I immediately was picked up by our friend Jeffrey, and uh, he brought me to their house where we were having family dinner. You know, Sunday family dinner is what we do. Oh my and gosh! So did that. Literally flew across the country. Yeah, and didn't even get to go home. No, no, oh went right gosh, to them. Girl. Um, that's and, you got four hours of sleep. Yeah, I was Golly. I was sleepy. My voice was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, went back home. My mother-in-law and aunt-in-law were visiting. Um, aunt-in-law. So, yeah. So, I dropped them off at the airport this morning, Tuesday morning. So, when I go home tonight, it'll be normal. Wow. And Shannon's show is over. So, just very much looking forward to things wow. just kind of what an calming eventful, down. What an eventful weekend. My yeah. goodness. That was me. What'd wow. you do? My week seems so boring compared to everything you went through, but that's okay. Maybe I'll keep it light. Um, I built a new RC car ramp. Ayo, you said the other one was uh, deteriorating a bit. It was, it was more of a prototype, but this one I built proper. I built it out of like pressure treated solid lumber. Yeah, proper ramp. Much stronger. You could probably honestly use it as a bicycle ramp. It's that sturdy. Um, Mm. And then I painted it with like exterior deck stain. And uh, so now I'm just going to leave it outside. So I don't I have to store it in my shed or whatever because it was kind of big. So I wanted to build it more sturdy. So is I it, is just, it like, taller, or steeper? It. It's the same exact design. Okay. I like, just modeled it after what I had because it worked fine. So just replace that. the materials. Yep. Yeah. Just, I had to rebuild basically the entire yeah. thing. But yep. So I finally did that. What'd you do with the old one? Bury it in the earth? Well, I used the same like <laughs> piece of wood. No. <laughs> I used the same piece of wood as like the platform. Okay. And the rest of it was like skinny little pieces of frame. So okay. they just used cheap plywood for that. Nice. So there wasn't much there aside from the, the main thing. So um, no, I didn't bury it in the earth. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> My log grave. Yeah. It's looking great, by the way. I got grass growing on top of it now. You'd never even know that it was there. <laughs> I will never find that not funny. What's so funny about burying logs? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of logs under there too good lord i have, an, I have more logs though like i didn't I find anything it's not to do with my logs so i buried them i buried them so i did i got those taken care of and now i have more logs and i'm like what do i do now do i just keep <laughs> digging holes do i just keep burying logs <laughs> what are you doing oh my god i don't know man what do i want to do what do i do there's so many trees they just keep falling what do i get what do i gonna do you can just leave them in the forest let nature do its thing yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i can do that <laughs> oh my gosh oh my, God, I love my, that life so much. In, my life is insane okay um 
more notable, my kids finished their first week of school mm -hmm. successfully, so that was good. Both my kids are in middle school now, which is great because they're both at one school, so we don't have to like have two different schools with two different schedules. But yeah, they're both in middle school now, so the I don't know, the the things we do as a family are the dynamic is changing and the kids are more social with their kids and trying to keep track of their two block schedules and what's happening on what days and all this kind of stuff. Are it's, they doing like after school stuff at all? No, all right, not, well, at, least not at not this a, point. That's not, yeah. a, that's not in the mix yet, I guess. That's yeah. Good. And we're trying to like arrange carpools to like drive their kids and stuff like that. Cause like there's, <clears throat> there's a severe school bus shortage in our area. Um, in fact, you know, we're, we're in a pretty rural area. They don't even have a morning pickup for the school bus in near our neighborhood. What? Yeah. They just don't have it. So, uh, and they have an afternoon pick, they have an afternoon drop off, but if we had the kids do that, they would get home at 5.15. Oh my God. School gets out of 3.45. So they would be on the bus for an hour All right. and a half. Speaking of rural area, home. you know what needs to happen? Brian Goulain needs to put on his overalls, get in that tractor, put the, put the trailer on there with some hay bales. Yeah. One man school bus. Just embrace it. Just embrace it. Why does it have to be hay bales for a school bus? Because you need to... It, Kids would be all itchy. You've got a role to play here. <laughs> you need to just... It would take so long to drive to school in a tractor. I mean, they'd still get home... Well, no, I guess... It might be faster than... 550, I don't know. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's a long friggin' time, man. Big old straw hat. I don't own a straw hat. You don't own overalls either, I do you? It'd be itchy. I do own overalls. Denim? Yeah, denim. Gray denim. Re oh. Yep. No, you need denim blue overalls. denim. You need blue... I tried to get blue, but they didn't have them. Oh. So I got gray. All right. Well, I'll get you some of those it's a, after. It's a bluish gray, though. Maybe it's, puce. I don't know that they make puce <laughs> denim overalls. That might that might not have much of a market. Oh. Um. Anyway, so kids are doing good in school. It's, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see. It's the second week right now. So, but they're doing fine. Ellie's homesick today, which is oh. great. So that didn't take long. Oh, man. But go figure. Um, got some more insect adventures, though. Um, so you know how I love, just love yellow jackets and I've heard that about flying you. stinging things. Yes. Well, I got a new one now. Uh, European hornets. So just take, a, take a, a wasp and, like, increase it, like, two or three times in size. No. Yeah. Yeah. They're big. No. They look freaky. And they're active at night, which is super fun. So... I've seen a couple of these things around. I've never seen them before this year. So I've seen a couple of just around here and there. And I'm like, good Lord, what is that thing? Because they're very hard to miss because they're so big. And so I was like, okay, I don't know what that was. Was oh, that like God. the master queen of the universe yellow jacket or something? Like, I don't know what that is. Um, but then I had, a, I had an interaction <laughs> happen. So I'm like, right, the kids have gone to bed. Rachel's gone to bed. I'm doing stuff, finishing up some work, doing the dishes, doing some random things. Ellie had this like paintbrush that the head of the paintbrush like separated from the wood. Mm -hmm. So I was just gonna like go in the garage, grab some super glue, glue it real quick, stick it on. Okay. Well, as soon as I go to open the garage door, this is like one o'clock in the morning. So I'm gonna do this and then go to bed. So I open up the garage door and this huge fricking hornet f immediately flies in to like, we've got a mud room with the laundry and yeah. stuff like that immediately flies into the house and i was like oh my gosh like my kids friggin hate bugs i was like i can't leave this thing in the oh, house oh man so it's, it came in and thankfully i was like whoops and i closed the other door because it's like a very small mud room so it came in from the garage so you were in there no i, I stepped out okay so I, I locked it into the mud room. oh so you needed to get ready for the thunderdome so, yeah so i was like okay this thing is aggressive, clearly. Uh huh. And again, this is late at night. Like most wasps and stuff like that, like they they don't they're not active. So I'm like, what is going on with this thing? Oh man. So I go and I, I get the vacuum, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna try to suck this thing up in the vacuum. But I'm thinking through it, and I'm like, I'm gonna open the door from the mudroom into the kitchen. Mm. If I can't get this thing right away, then this thing's just gonna be open in the house. Plus I'm gonna be running the vacuum, probably- Can you go in the other way? Freaking out. You went outside. So, so that was my thought process ah. was like, okay, so if I if I go out the back door and yep. then go in, open the garage door, go. I can get to it from the other way. And then if it comes out and attacks me, I'm in the garage. Right. And it might fine. even go all the way outside. It might even go outside. Great. Great, that was my plan. So I was like, cool. Solid. 
So as I'm like thinking through this, I can hear the thing like buzzing, like Mad. trying to get trying to get through the door. And Ugh. I'm just like, ah, oh, this is so freaky. So I was like, okay. Did you put on your B suit? I didn't. Okay. I didn't, but I I probably should have. That would have been smart. I mean, you have a I thought suit. about it, but I was like, let me just get this thing. Like I yeah. just needed to get it out of the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like whatever. Just punch it. So yeah, but I was thinking like, let me go suck this thing up. So I grabbed the shop back from the from the get out, garage. Just suck, it, suck it. Let me try to suck it. And I open it up and I've got like a little door stopper on the door mm -hmm. that goes to the garage. So I had a little door stopper, so it was propped open and I could see the thing. And it was like, blah, 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 blah. like, I was like, oh my gosh, this thing freaks me out. And by the way, like I've been stung so many times. I got memories as a kid. First time I ever mowed the lawn when I was seven, I ran over a yellow jacket's oh. nest and got stung. So I have a little bit of like, Ugh! <laughs> whenever I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm normally very composed with these things because I've dealt with it a lot. Yeah. But you're one of the more composed people I know. Yeah. But if one of them like surprises me and like something like that, my lizard brain takes over yeah. and I kind of freak out. Yeah. So I was like borderline in that territory. But I was like, not going to freak out because yeah. I don't want to wake up the whole family and they're going to think we're being robbed or something. Yeah. It's just a bug. So I was like, okay. So I open up the other door and the thing flies out into the garage. It doesn't like come near me or anything, but it goes up towards the light. And I was like, Okay, but it's like too tall. I can't reach it with the vacuum. And I'm like, I don't really want to deal with it anyway. So I'm like, okay. Bow so, and arrow. <laughs> yes. Hatch it. I'll destroy the lights. Throwing knives. <sighs> so, so many options. Well, the thing is there. And so I'm like, okay, if I just leave it in the garage, maybe it'll just die overnight or whatever. Or it'll just chill. And then I'll like wake up and open the garage door. Let it maybe get out. Because like, that's where the car is. Like Rachel's going to come out in the morning and what, get attacked by this thing. So mm. I was just like, oh my gosh. So it's, it's not over yet. The saga continues. So then the thing gets in there, whatever. I close the door to the house and I'm like, okay, now I have this thing in my garage, whatever. I'll shut the garage and I'll at least just go to bed because now I'm tired. Well, wouldn't you know it? I go back around to the back door of the house and there's another one. Just trying to get into the house. They're in cahoots. Trying to get into my glass like sliding door. This is personal. And it's like all up on the door. And I was just like, what are you doing to me? What are you doing, crazy bug? Why are you even awake? <laughs> it's your bedtime. <laughs> what are you doing, crazy bug? Yeah. I was like, are y'all in coordinated here? Go to bed. And I had just come out of that door too. So it's oh like, I don't know if it was like just lying in wait. So anyway, didn't really feel like dealing with that one. Yeah. So I was like, okay, how do I actually get back into my house? Because now both of my entrances are like blocked by these bugs. Time to go to sleep in the fancy shed. I thought about it. No, I didn't really. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, I am going to just open up the garage door again, try to not get attacked by this bug and just like rush into the house and hope that it doesn't follow me in again. And I'm just back where I was before. Uh, so that's what I did. And what was crazy is when I opened up the garage door, I then couldn't see it. I didn't know where it was. So I was just like, all right, just got to go for it. So I turned like the lights on and stuff like that because maybe it would be attracted to the lights. Yeah. I never saw it though. So I don't know what happened to it. Oh God, it's still in there. It, I don't think so at this point. I did see there's like some dead ones because they do. Like I've got windows in my garage yeah. and bugs get caught there all the time and yeah. they just like die at the window. So. So I was actually able to see one up close because it died at the window and I was able to like see it and it's a big freaking. So that's why I was able to like go online and be like, what the heck is this bug? Um, yeah, apparently it's a European Hornet and they are, uh, you know, they can be aggressive. Their stings are apparently very painful and uh, yeah, but they attack yellow jackets. So I thought that was cool. So if they do that, then I'm cool with that. But they are active at night. Great. So I'm like, Awesome. When yellow jackets aren't active. Yes. So now I get to be paranoid all the time about flying stinging oh things. Oh my God. So yeah, that was fun. Anyway, oh, that was a new adventure. So I'm now so I'm like sorry. kind of on the lookout for those, but I told Rachel and the kids about it and yeah. didn't freak them out too much. Yeah. But I'm just so like, they need to be aware of it. Be aware that this yeah. is a thing. But thankfully my kids, they don't, they're not like super outdoorsy themselves. And they are definitely not like leave the door open all the time. Like, I'm if I'm like going outside for four seconds to get something off the porch or whatever, the kids are always like, shut the door, shut the door, bugs, 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 shut the door. So I don't have to worry about them. Um, yeah. And then last little adventure, um, I had my lawn mower uh, battery was on the fritz. 
sort of dying or something. It's only two year old batteries. And I was like fully, like I charged it and everything. Anyway, so I was having Joe's from over the lawn. So I pulled it out of the shed and then turned it off and was checking some fluids and stuff like that. And then when I went to start it up again, it didn't start. And I was like, what? So I then had to jump it. I had to jumpstart my lawnmower, which is always a weird experience. Um, and then it was cool. Joseph went and drove. But then, of course, he mowed for like 20 minutes and then we got rain, which we have not had rain for like weeks. It's been a while. So we really needed it. So I was like, not that upset. Yeah. But then he brings the lawnmower back. And before we, you know, I could tell him not to shut the lawnmower off, he turns it off. And I was like, crap. I was like, this thing's probably not going to start again. So, yeah, it didn't start. <laughs> So, Ugh. and I was like, I can't, I don't really want to jumpstart this thing like in a rainstorm. That seems like a hazard. Mm -hmm. So I like took a tarp and threw it over top of it. And I was like, we'll see about that. And so then I had to jumpstart it to get it back into the shed after the rain stopped. And now I have to deal with it. I have to go get a battery or whatever. So, you know, adventures, but that's, that's a thing. So that's, there's a, <laughs> not as exciting, but you know. So some excitement. Yeah, in the, in the there's world of that's, some, that's some adventure <laughs> for sure. Go figure. But, you know, whenever Rachel is, you know, whenever there's things that, that Rachel has difficulties with me, what, it, what, what am I saying? Whenever I am difficult to deal with for Rachel, she's always grateful about me dealing with things like the bugs and the lawn and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So it all evens out in the end, right? All right. That's it. That's all I got. All right. Well, we are... Uh... Gonna, running good, yeah, good good amount of time here we're, yeah it's gonna be i really stretched it out didn't i we're gonna yeah all right we got a couple quick company updates company updates yep. and then we'll wrap it up before we do a company update oh i wanted to just let everybody know that if you wanted a free ink sample oh you're doing this again a ferris wheel press buttered popcorn oh add it to your cart the sample of butter popcorn, mm -hmm. and in all caps, use the coupon code BUTTER, and it'll be free for you nice. for this week, starting from when this pen cast airs on, on uh, September 1st. September 1st at around 10 ish until midnight the following week um, when the next one. That'll be September ends. 8th. Yep. Yep. So cool. There you go. Fun. And the other one, Emerald of Shavor, Emerald of Chicken, will be no more. You won't, you won't be able to get you won't be able to get that freebie anymore. Emerald of chicken. Yeah, that was the freebie last week. Oh right, right, right. Yeah, right, 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 right. There you go. Cool. Butter. Awesome. Thank you for sticking with us this long. That's your prize. Do that. Ha! Cool. All right. Actual company updates. I mean, you got that something. Um, I really hope. We, I think we'll get this video out this week, right? Yeah. Okay. I'll go ahead and mention it. So you don't have to tell what it is. To, yes. Oh, I'm not going to say what yeah. it is. You got to watch it. So we're launching a new series. It's not going to be like a rapid succession series, but a new series called the Fountain Pen Hall of Fame. So this is Drew's idea. And uh, I want to thank him for that. And uh, we kind of ran with it. So setting up a quasi not really official but sounds kind of super official, official super legit kind of official 100 percent. so but le we legitimately wanted to put thoughtfulness into you know what are the pens that are really worthy of like a hall of fame so um we're doing that now so um we had that first video out i explained all the rules and everything which is always the most engaging part of any video is rules um so we'll have that and then mm -hmm. uh induct the first pen I won't say what it is. What do you think it is? You gotta watch it. You'll know by now. You you may have already watched the video, yeah. but we will just have that out not too long before this video published. So um, I have recorded the second one already, but then after that, I don't know. I don't know what frequency we'll do it, but it's probably like only a couple of pens a year that we'll yeah. do. We just wanted to kick it off with a couple. So that's a thing. Um, we have the Sailor Don't Miss the Boat sale again. So that's a thing happening for this month only. And then something else kind of cool. Uh, company update wise is um, Newsweek put out something called the best online shops of 2023. Oh, So this is powered by Statista who does a whole bunch of different statistical things. Um, and so we've been on this list several times before we have, it's not something we apply for. It's literally, they look at websites. They look at things like analytic data. They do, I don't know. They apparently have like all these different data points they use. Um, they look at website traffic and they interview people and look at customer service ratings and all these types of different points. Um, and uh, we are pleased to say that we were number three in the arts and crafts category. This is my first time hearing this. 
Really? I know we were pretty up there last year. Yeah, we were. We were like number eight or something like that. Yeah. But I mean, this is for basically all websites. Like there's like a numerical score. In this score category though. In this category, but they give a numerical score of like basically where you rank. Mm -hmm. So like where your number kind of falls like in your category. So we're number three. But if you look at the numerical score, there's a lot of other companies in other categories that we outranked basically. Um, even the ones within our category, like Hallmark, Michaels, like we beat them according to this score thing, which is blowing my mind. Cool. But it's very cool for Rachel because she does so much behind the scenes to make our website what it is that is kind of unseen a little bit. Oh, yeah. So it's it's always nice for her to get some some validation. Who is number there. one or number two? Uh, in our category? Great question. Oh, that's right. It's not a big I have it. No, I have it right here. It's... Uh, Let's see here. They have like a bunch of different categories. Nope, that's fashion. Give me one second. I will tell you. We're not food and healthcare. Where's arts and crafts? Garden and crafts. Home living. Nope. All right, so we outrank Hallmark, Hobby Lobby, William Sonoma, West Elm, Wayfair, mm -hmm. Home Depot, and Lowe's. Yeah, and my favorite one we outranked was Amazon. Hey! We outranked Amazon. Amazon according and their to arts the and crafts. No, this was like Amazon as a whole thing. Oh, they like have the lower site. than 8.35? They had 8.33. hey -o. So that was pretty cool. Man, what the heck is this list? It's no big deal. Anyway, game. it's a big list. We'll post it. We'll probably like link it in our email newsletter and stuff like that. But, you know, this is kind of neat. It's nice for our little our little shop. Heck yeah. Out there. We're definitely the David and the Goliath of Thank the, the online shopping world. But that's it for company updates. Now it's time to wrap this thing up. Well, we want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us some questions so that we can keep on doing the show. Check out goodlypens.com for ink, pens, paper, all that good stuff. And my random fun fact, pulled a couple of pirate things. Yeah. Since uh, we had the pirate party. I did no validation of this whatsoever. I hope that Southwestern University or whatever who put out an article about this, they hope their facts are correct. But don't blame me. I just pulled it from the internet. But... Um, you probably know this, Drew, the traditional skull and crossbones flag. Do you know what that's known as? The Jolly Roger. The Jolly Roger. Yeah. That's what it's called. Um, pirate symbols such as hourglasses, horned skeletons, and lifted drinking glasses conveyed the fleetingness of a violent life. So that's why you see those represented. Yeah, that Blackbeard's flag had a uh, drinking glass and, mm -hmm. and an hourglass. Um, the oh. word buccaneer derives from the French Boucanier to Ooh. cook meat over an open flame. I didn't know that was... Boucanier. That's cool to have one word to express all that. That is cool. Yeah, so you're a buccaneer if you're camp campfire cooking. Nice. Apparently. Uh, and lastly, Blackbeard apparently intimidated prisoners by weaving hemp into his beard and, and lighting setting them it on, on fire. fire. That is insane. That he did. Wow. He did. That's... It was created lots of smoke too. And they burned very slowly, so he could he could chill, do that for a while. Wouldn't that burn his beard too? Eventually, I think they were pretty long. I I, I was, was it always like, on... like out past his beard. Yeah, and obviously he would put them under his hat too. Weird. Yeah, it's a weird guy. Yeah, they're not really <laughs> sure what his last name was. There's some people that say Teach or Thatch. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, but he definitely got his head chopped off. That much is certain. Yikes. And then. Some people say that, well, at least it was reported that his body, his you know, headless body swam around his ship three times. I don't think that's true. Well, well, you weren't there, Brian. I don't think that's possible. Well, have you ever seen someone's head chopped off? That's just what happens. I have never seen it. You know the expression like a chicken with the head cut off, right? Yeah. A human with his head cut off just right, you know, humans, swims. Humans aren't chickens. No, they swim. They don't run. It is weird that chickens can run around with their heads cut I don't off. even know if that's true. It is because Rachel's birthday is <laughs> Mike the Headless Chicken Day. Oh. So Mike the Headless Chicken, apparently, there's an extra bonus fun fact for oh, you. Oh, God. He was a chicken who got his head cut off and lived for like 25 days or something crazy like that. And they would like feed it through his like little neck like hole or whatever. It's really gross, but I know apparently he's like, look it up, Mike the Headless Chicken. But anyway, his, the day they celebrate him is for Rachel's birthday. All right, so next time you're celebrating Mike the Headless <laughs> Chicken, give old Rachel Goulet a shout out. There you go. The things you learn over your lifetime. Anyway. And in the Bencast during our turkey hammock section. That's Woo! right. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Have a good one and ride on. <laughs>